Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this first official meeting of the Board on Animal Health Sciences, Conservation and Research. I am Bob Disco. I am one of the co-chairs of this meeting. And with me is my fellow co-chair, Dr. Barbara Natterson Horowitz. And the two of us will lead you through a little introduction here on the, um, well, the, the existence of this board and its role and where we think we are headed. So, and, and a little bit on the agenda for the next two days. If you go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so first off, for those who are unfamiliar and even those of us who have been involved for several years, it's always good to look at the organization to see how this works. And so the National Academy of Sciences, of National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine or the National Academies is the top row of our uh, org chart. Um, below that, you see an executive office with some other central offices and a report review committee that comes at that level. Then below that is the divisions. And the one that's highlighted in the middle, as it should be, is the Division on Earth and Life Sciences, Earth and Life Studies, uh, or DELS, which is what we are all a part of. Next slide, please. Within DELS, there are several boards, and they are all listed here. The one highlighted is the Board on Animal Health Science, Conservation, and Research. Um, currently, our co-directors are Robin Shane and Kavita Berger, and you'll also notice two of the other boards have their names. Um, they are also directors at those boards as well. Um, all of these boards, um, get together um, by, by, by Zoom um, periodically to uh, talk about things that can be possible cross-board activities and um, other activities that are going on within the boards. And so this is um, a, a great opportunity that exists for all of us to get together, network, and talk about issues that are common to more than one board. Um, Go ahead to the next slide, please. So this is a bit on the academies. And as the academies, the role is to provide guidance on program direction and priorities, help resolve scientific or science policy controversies, provide technical analyses and independent peer review, inform science policy debates, build and maintain scientific networks, increase the visibility of emerging scientific fields and science policy issues, and summarize state of the science to audiences of various technical knowledge. So this could be um, scientists within the field, in other fields, or even the general public. So these are some of the roles that we aim to um, fulfill as part of the National Academies. Next slide, please. So the National Academy's approach, um, there's five pieces to it. Um, so there's stakeholder involvement. And what you're doing is trying to get leaders in different aspects of the uh, community together to be able to talk about issues that affect all of them. And so that the example here is academia, industry, and government sectors, but even other non-government associations um, play a role in that. Uh, independence. We want to ensure that our advisory activities are independent and objective. Um, people are looking to the National Academies as a neutral voice, and so we need to respect that. Uh, innovation, we want to use uh, innovative tools and methods to achieve the goals and objectives that are set out for the different um, boards and board projects. Collaboration. Uh, so here again, we're leveraging the expertise across disciplines and across boards so that we can have answers to some of these questions that bring in the, the wide breadth of knowledge that exists in our country. And the last um, square is expertise and information. 
and that's to enable an exchange between the public, private, academic, and nonprofit sectors of information and uh, other data that uh, is vital to the projects that are being undertaken by the boards. Next slide. Okay, so we're gonna sit here for a while. <laughs> um, so I wanted to take a moment to recognize, um, we had hoped that Dr. Lou Kintner, who authored the historical summary uh, paper or lead author of that paper that's in uh, volume 62, issue three of the ILR Journal, um, we had hoped that he would be able to be one of our keynote speakers today. Fortunately for him, he is celebrating his 50th wedding anniversary and he is on a nice trip with his wife. And so we said, have a nice trip and we will cover this in another way. And we'll cover it briefly now by just saying that this is the 70th year of ILAR. ILAR was established in 1953. It was one of the first organizations in laboratory animal sciences that was created. It precedes ALAS and ALAC and all those others by almost a decade. So it really was the, the first networking piece that existed for laboratory animal veterinarians and scientists in this country. Um, it has done amazing things in those 70 years. It is most noted, of course, for publication of the Guide for Care and Use of Animals, which originally started as an NIH publication, then came over and became a, an ILAR publication. And we are in the midst of discussing what to do with that guide in the, uh, in the next iteration um, as part of a standing committee that was created a few years ago to look into that project. And um, so, I'll stop there. Um, please read that article if you have not. Um, Lou Kintner, K-I-N-T-N-E-R. Um, K-I-N-T-E-R. Uh, okay, thank you, Corey. K-I-N-T-E-R. Um, and he is the um, uh, lead author on that paper and it is in volume 62, number three which is actually, as of this point in time, the last issue of that journal. Um, it is on hiatus right now, and determining what to do with that is one of the um, tasks that lies before us as um, a board in what we might wanna do as far as communication methods in the future. Um, so, this transition occurred from ILAR to BASCR. Um, and the purposes, we came up with three of them for this transition. There are actually many more, but the three primary ones. It's to better represent and reflect the expansion of disciplines on research involving animals, okay? So we are expanding beyond laboratory animals. And now we're talking about issues such as wildlife health, Conservation biology, One Health, Planetary Health. We are, we are going bigger. And the speakers that you'll hear today will reflect that. To facilitate and promote transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary interactions that accelerate scientific insights. Okay? And to strengthen research that benefits humans, animals, environmental, and planetary health. So those are three of the main things, main objectives that we have in moving forward from an associate or a, a council, an institute, sorry, an institute that focused on laboratory animals work to become a board which focuses on um, the broader animal issues that face us today. And um, the other change, as many of you probably picked up, is that we are now a board which puts us on equivalent footing with the rest of the um, boards within Dells. It's not that we were treated differently within Dells, but a lot of people didn't quite understand what we were and why we were an institute rather than a board. And that's just simply historical, but um, this puts us all on a more equivalent plane. Barbara, do you have anything you wanna add at this point in time? 
No, I think that, that sums it up. This has been a process that's, uh, I think, started about three, maybe a little bit more than three years ago. And um, so today marks sort of, I guess, the official launch, let's say. All right, next slide, please. Um, so this is the statement of task that the board came up with. This was generated, uh, I wanna thank Kavita and Robin for sort of putting the first uh, framework of this together. And then we, um, as a board, uh, met by Zoom and tweaked it. Um, as you can imagine, there was lots of wordsmithing that happened during that time. Um, but we're fairly comfortable with, uh, with what this says. And I, I just wanna emphasize the two lines that are highlighted in colors. Um, so the first is the focus, and it is focusing on supporting responsible and scientifically rigorous approaches to research that involves animals and advances in alternative approaches to animal research. And then in green, it's talking about um, some of the activities and studies. And what we're looking at is to examine innovative methods and approaches to studies involving animals, develop guidance to ensure the appropriate care and use of animals in research. And again, now that we're talking about all animals and foster greater public understanding of the research that science, uh, conservation of the, I'm sorry, I could, of the issues that science conservation and research associated with, the la with animals needs to address. We are looking to be collaborative. We're looking to work with other boards and um, other boards tackled animal-based issues in the past. Uh, that was not just the purview of ILAR, um, but uh, now we are in a position, I think, to better work with some of those other boards on some of the projects that they have um, in their wheelhouse that we might be able to uh, add expertise to. Next slide, please. Okay. Here is the current board membership on the left. Um, so you can see right now we are at 10 members. Um, we are talking about adding members and we also have uh, terms that will be expiring that we have to work on. So um, anybody who is in the audience who knows of someone that would be an awesome board member, and I stress the word awesome, um, please nominate them, even if it's yourself. Um, go ahead and do that um, because we are going to be looking at how we are going to expand this um, board. And on the right in the blue column is the awesome staff that we have here at the National Academies that's conducting all the work behind the scenes and getting everything ready for today's program. Um, and I think I, I speak for all of the board when I thank them profusely for the hard work they've done in packaging all this together and sparing us the uh, trouble of having to do it ourselves. Next slide, please. Okay. So today we'll have two keynote speakers to start off. The first is Elaine Ostrander from the uh, National Human Genome Research Institute. And um, she's gonna talk about her research on dogs and um, what dogs wish we knew about their diseases, morphology, and behavior. And our, our second keynote uh, speaker is Dr. Raina Plowright from Cornell University, and she's gonna talk about the dynamics of pathogens in reservoir host and understanding spillover risk. So talking more about uh, zoonotic issues and concerns where we have animal and human health in peril. Next slide, please. Okay, then we are going to have, let me, let me just take, take a step and say that our invited speakers today, our keynotes and our panelists, um, we, we, we chose you know, very you know, prominent scientists and folks who can also really um, reflect and show what this expanded landscape of um, you know disciplines that are that are doing research involving animals. What what the potential is just the just the beginning. So we really wanted to just kind of feature what's already happening. So um, we'll be having panel discussion uh, speakers after lunch, I believe, and they will include um, 
So we have uh, Dr. Claire, Claire Hankerson, University of Pennsylvania, achievements and emerging needs um, to the, for the care and use of laboratory animals. We'll have, um, who's from the, I'm sorry, I can't read that far. Yeah, exactly. Cynthia Smith. Yeah, Cynthia Smith. I just can't read at that okay. distance. Why don't you go ahead and do it? I don't think. Oh, I'm okay. Well, the the next uh, panel discussion speaker is Dr. Cynthia Smith. She's from the Marine Mammal Foundation, and she's going to be talking about studies in conservation, health effects from the environment of marine systems. Tracy Gold. Okay, Tracy Goldstein um, from the One Health Institute at, C at Colorado State University, Wildlife Surveillance for One Health. Steve Asofsky, Cornell Wildlife Health Center at Cornell University, speaking on Beyond Fences, Policy Options for Wildlife, Livelihoods, and Transboundary Animal D Disease Management in Southern Africa. And Rowena Watson from uh, the US Department of State, speaking on International Standards for Animals in Research and Wildlife Animal Trade. And Barb, just a note, there's a message from Rowena um, saying that we need to correct the, uh, her title, so the title of her talk. So okay. I will um, share it as soon as I get it. Thank you. Next slide, please. That's the end of the slide deck. Okay, so that's the agenda for today. Um, then the... Uh, Board meets tomorrow in a closed session to review some activities. Some of the uh, cross-board um, opportunities will be discussed. Uh, we'll have representatives from several of the other boards here to tell us what they're working on, and, and we can then chat with them directly on where some opportunities lie. Um, I want to end just by saying that uh, the other day in the car, um, Elton John's uh, Circle of Life came on the radio. It's been now playing in my head for about three days. Um, but it was it was kind of funny because I had joked in talking with some people that this was a big moment where we're all coming together and sort of a circle of life celebration. So of course, um, the, uh, the gods chose to put it in on my Sirius XM channel so I could have it in my head. Um, if I break out singing it later, you'll understand, okay. And with that, I think we move over to our first keynote. Am I correct? I'm not correct. Rob, Rob is giving me a look. Yeah, well, I just wanted to, to say to the, the people out there in the world of internet who are, are listening into this presentation that um, you have an opportunity to ask questions using the tool Slido that should have been part of the registration. Um, it's a very simple, put in your name and email and type in your question, and then you'll see all the questions from other people and be able to basically click on a little up arrow if you want to upvote questions asked by others so that they automatically sort themselves in the order of popularity. And uh, um, I encourage you to do that. Um, if, you, if you're not on Slido, but would like to be, you just have to go to Slido, S-L-I-D-O dot com. And um, the, the number associated with this meeting is um, pound sign 2481508. So that's pound sign 2481508. And that'll open up um, the question um, platform for you. So I hope if you'd like to ask questions, we'll be collecting them as people speak and at the end of their presentations. Thank you. And now, uh... now, okay, great. So I am pleased to um, present to you our first keynote speaker. It is Dr. Elaine Ostrander. She is Chief and Distinguished Senior Investigator of Cancer Genetics and Comparative Genomics Branch at the National Human Genome Research Institute of NIH. Um, she received her PhD from Oregon Health and Sciences University, did postdoc training at Harvard and Berkeley, went to the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs and was working on the Canine Genome Project, assembling the foundational resources needed to navigate the canine genome. Dr. Ostrander joined the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center and the University of Washington in 93, and she moved to NIH in 2004 
to assume the position of chief and senior investigator at the NHGRI. So I welcome Dr. Elaine Ostrander as our first keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let me try the screen share again and see if I can get that. Uh... Ooh, we did it once. Let me try it again. Yeah, my talk doesn't seem to be coming up. Not sure what to do. Try it again. All right, there's the talk. Let's try the share. There it is. We see it, but you just need to put it in presentation mode. Mm -hmm. There. There you go. All right, there we go. Thank you everybody for your patience. And thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to, to share with you um, the things that we've been doing in the domestic dog. Um, we have a, a great relationship with the general public and ours is really citizen science. It's not things that are being done in the laboratory. So I wanna give you a, an overview of how that kind of um, relationship with the general public that we have um, can inform studies of morphology, disease susceptibility, and behavior um, from a genetics point of view. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is, why are dogs amenable to genetic studies? Why, why are we even doing this? Well, um, the first is large numbers. There's nearly 90 million dogs that are owned in the United States. Dogs live and they're exposed to the same environment as, as humans. So they, they um, really serve to reflect what's going on in the world around us. Healthcare, dogs get pretty much the same diseases as humans. They receive extensive preventative and diagnostic healthcare. You know, in 2022, Americans spent $136 billion on their pets, and about half of that went to healthcare, medicines, vet visits, um, insurance, vaccines. And so we have really great health records that we can make use of. Sampling. We can sample multiple generations of a, of a dog pedigree due to the fact that they have relatively long lifespans. I mean, some breeds on average, the dogs live to be about 20. So we can even get four generations of a pedigree, which is just great for doing genetic studies. And finally, and we'll talk about this um, a fair amount over the, the next 25 minutes, the population structure of dogs is very well suited to genetic studies because of that division of dogs um, into breeds. Now, people always ask me, you know, where did modern breeds come from and, and when? Well, dogs originated in the old world, their sister to the Eurasian gray wolf, they're from an ancient, now extinct lineage, and they were the only large carnivore to be domesticated. Now that probably took place about 25,000 years ago. So evolutionarily, that is just the tiniest, tiniest drop in the bucket. And that really works in our favor as we seek to identify genes behind all of these interesting traits. If you go to the dog park and you, you look around, most of the modern breeds that you're seeing were created during Victorian times. Um, there are about 350 breeds that are recognized worldwide and the American Kennel Club, which is the largest registering body in the United States, um, recognizes just about 200 with one or two new ones added every year. So if, if you were to ask me, um, put that down there. <laughs> if you were to ask me, why I've devoted the last 30 years of my career to studying dogs, I could really sum it up in one word, and that word would be diversity. Dogs have an extraordinary level of diversity as we look across breeds. In terms of body size over here on the right, you know, dogs are actually the most morphologically diverse land mammal on the earth. In terms of behavior, we all know stereotypic breed behaviors. Uh, for instance, this herding dog here, herding sheep, a border collie. Disease, 
dogs get all the same diseases we do on on the lower right here this is actually a melanoma and it presents and it's treated and responds to treatment pretty much the same way in humans and dogs and some of the traits we're really curious about like um, hair curl and fur curl um, are controlled in part by some of the same genes loss of hair alopecia controlled in part by some of the same genes in, in dogs and humans so as we learn about the the underpinnings of different traits in dogs we're really learning about ourselves and that's one of the things that makes it so exciting um, to do dog, dog genetics i don't know why this keeps happening um not sure why this keeps happening but we'll try it again All right, there we go. All right, now when we think about um, dog breeds, and there's several shown for you here on this slide, within breeds, there's a lot of homogeneity. All these Dalmatians look the same, the Basset Hounds look the same, the Bernese Mountain Dogs look the same. And within their genome, there's a tremendous amount of homogeneity or likeness from dog to dog. But when we look across breeds, there's a lot of physical heterogeneity, behavioral heterogeneity, disease susceptibility heterogeneity. And not surprising, there's a lot of heterogeneity um, in their genomes as well. So a couple things to keep in mind during this talk. All dogs, no matter what breed, are members of the same species, Canis lupus familiaris, no matter how different they look. My lab is in a long-term partnership with dog owners, dog breeders, dog lovers, veterinarians. We don't keep any dogs in kennels or in labs. We don't breed dogs. We don't direct any breedings. Ours is really a citizen science project. And on any given weekend, if you're at a dog show, a specialty event, an agility trial, an obedience trial, you're likely to find someone from my lab there participating. We collect and we store DNA from many, many different breeds, um, as many as we possibly can. Um, and we've stored DNA thus far from about 45,000 dogs. So that's what's in my freezer so far. Now, um, this is work that was done by Heidi Parker starting in 2004, and it continues to this day. And Heidi's been interested in learning how different breeds relate one to another. So to execute this experiment, we went out and we collected DNA from lots of different dog breeds. This particular iteration has 161 breeds. We've now got about 300 breeds. We got 10 dogs from each breed and we interrogated them at 170,000 different positions in the genome. And then we put it through a series of computer programs asking how do these different breeds relate one to another? And what came out are 23 clades, and each clade is a different color. And, and they kind of make sense. You know, over here at about 10 o'clock are the terriers, the border, the wire fox, the Australian, the silky, the Yorkshire, et cetera, et cetera. Down here in red are the spaniels, English Springer, American Cocker Field, so, so on and so forth. Over here in blue are the bully breeds, the boxer, the bulldog, the Boston Terrier, the French bulldog. Now, we are ever expanding this because it is vital, absolutely vital to the the development and to the design of our experiments. Let me tell you why. So let's say a dog comes into your office with epilepsy. It's a fairly complex disease. We know there's lots of human genes, lots of dog genes. It's a, a Boston Terrier. Well, if I were just studying Boston Terriers, I wouldn't have a lot of statistical power, but I could add affected boxers, bulldogs, uh, miniature bull terriers, staffordshire bull terriers, because you can see here in the blue that they all share a recent common ancestor. So all of those dogs likely have the same mutation in the same gene. I could do the same thing. A Scottish Terrier walks into my office with epilepsy. If I'm restricted to just studying Scottish Terriers, I'm limited. But I can add in all those other Terrier breeds, affected dogs. And then I have a lot more statistical power. Now, the gene affecting the, the Scottish Terriers, because again, the Scottish ter the Terriers all um, share common recent common ancestors, it's going to be different than what's going on in those bully breeds. But that's great because it's a way to tackle the very complex problem human geneticists face of locus heterogeneity. There's lots of genes that are responsible for any given trait, but humans don't really come with very good signposts that say, we're this gene, we're this gene, we're that gene, but dogs do in the form of that breed structure. 
And the more we know about how breeds relate one to another, the more powerful our analyses can be. So let's start with disease. Okay, cancer. Many breeds have an elevated risk for specific cancer. So how does that help dogs? How does that help humans? Well, we know that um, osteosarcoma is very common um, in the long limb breeds, Scottish Deerhounds, Irish Wolfhounds, Great Danes, and so on. Bladder cancer is one we see in the Scotties and the Westies, as well as in the Shetland Sheep Dogs, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, histiocytic sarcoma we see in Bernie's mountain dogs and flat coated retrievers, extremely lethal disorder. And gastric cancer, also very lethal in humans and dogs. We see in the Belgian breeds and in the Chow Chow. These are all things that over time my lab has studied. So let me give you the example of invasive urinary cancer. So um, this accounts for only about 1% to 2% of all tumors in the dog, but that's 50,000 dogs each year. So that's a lot of veterinary bills. That's a lot of distraught owners. Um, at the time of diagnosis, 50% will have already metastasized to distant organs. The average survival is a year, and the most common treatments really have not changed in the last 50 years. Now, collaborating with Debbie Knapp, we've been able to do some really interesting things, in part because look what happens when you look at risk for getting the disease in dogs. If you're a Scottish Terrier, your chances of getting the disease, your odds ratio is 21 fold higher than the average mixed breed dog walking down the street. 21 fold higher. You just don't see that in humans. It's a geneticist dream. American Eskimo dog, six and a half fold higher. Shetland Cheap dogs, six fold higher. So these are the kinds of things that genetic studies, you know, they're really made of in order to get the best, most rigorous um, and, and most reproducible results. So let's look at the Shetland Sheep dog. Um, so we did a genome-wide association study of 49 cases and 50 controls. Now in dogs, you don't have to collect hundreds of thousands of dogs. You couldn't find 100,000 um, Shetland sheep dogs, probably, um, or I'm sure you couldn't. Um, what matters is lineage, and the American Kennel Club has given us access to five-generation pedigrees of all the dogs that we sample, um, and, and so we're able to get a group of very unrelated dogs and capture most of the variation in the breed. You're looking at a Manhattan plot, and the alternating gray and black are the different chromosomes from 1 to 38 in addition to the X. Um, each dot represents an individual place um, in the genome that we've interrogated. And you see this nice bright red signal on canine chromosome 13. And that's telling us it's statistically significant at 10 to the negative seventh, even after correction for population structure and all the appropriate things, that we have three, addition, three sequential markers or single nucleotide polymorphisms um, that are, are telling us that there's a gene down there that's important in increasing risk um, for bladder cancer um, in the Shetland sheep job. But now we're going to do the same thing I just talked about. We want more power. We want to refine that region. So we're going to add in more breeds. With the Shetland Sheepdog, we had that p-value of 10 to the negative 7. But now I added in data from collies, affected Australian shepherds, affected border collies. And now my p-value goes up to 10 to the negative 10th. Um, and importantly, um, when you're looking at that bottom panel, the region under the curve really contracts. So the number of genes I have to look at um, that are likely can candidates greatly, greatly reduces. So this is a very effective strategy that makes use of the data that you saw, the wheel that you saw on the previous slide. Now, months and months and months and months of work, I'll just give you a, a punchline. Um, you know, the gene that, that looks to be the culprit in this particular case is Nepal 1. Um, the coding variant is um, something that we see in affected dogs. If we just look at how common it is in dogs in general, it's very rare. Outside the clade, um, we see it in only 0.0001 dogs, and that's looking at genome sequence from 1,700 dogs. Um, the gene is involved in ion transport. The mutation is predicted to alter transmembrane um, domain protein, and our result is significant. 
Now we applied a, a series of tools to look at pathogenicity, to look if it's a cancer driver, to look if it's overexpressed in, in bladder cancer cell lines. And the answer to all those things is yes. So this is really somewhere that we wanna put energy in terms of understanding bladder cancer for dogs, but also for humans. You know, this isn't something that popped up on, on human studies. So this now becomes a, an area of focus for human invasive bladder cancer as well. It has been looked at in human oral squamous cell carcinoma, um, and its expression is associated with poor survival and with metastases. So this is, is really a great place to spend our time. Um, um, in the bottom panel, of red and brown, we're just showing you that this is in an incredibly well-conserved region of the genome. It's really only in this clade of dogs, this at-risk clade of dogs, um, that we see this particular mutation. Now, this isn't the only gene we found. We've actually found you know, several others. And just like in humans, cancer is not a, a one gene story for the most part in dogs. So there's a, another gene on chromosome 28 that increases risk if you have the correct allele. Um, and combinations of those together with mutations that we found in genes on chromosome 4 and 9 and 21 can either increase your risk, as you see down here in the aqua cloud, they can decrease decrease your risk as in the blue um, rectangle, or they can balance each other out and you really have no change in risk at all. So these kinds of studies take massive amounts of numbers and money to do in humans, and they become greatly, greatly simplified because of breed structure in dogs. Now, one other way to access genes that are important in disease, but also allow us to really study something that I've wanted to study for, for years and years and years and years, um, is to study morphology across breeds. So we have been doing that since 2007, and we've identified genes that control body size across different breeds, height and weight, skull shape, leg length, coat color, um, as well as everything you would ever want to know about fur. In some ways, um, the body size has been really, you know, the coolest and the most interesting. So we've shown that about 20 genes are responsible for most of the variation in body size, going from the very smallest chihuahua um, to the very tallest of the Great Danes and Irish Wolfhounds, Scottish Deerhounds, or big mass of dogs, the Newfoundlands, the St. Bernards, the Leonberger. This is very different than what you see in humans. Hundreds of genes have been identified that account for variation in human height and human weight. Um, so compare that to just the 20 we're seeing that account for 90% in dogs. So this is a recurring theme that we see in dog genetics. Small numbers of loci of large effect responsible for traits, whereas in humans it's large numbers of loci of small effect. And that really speaks to the evolutionary time period um, that, that dogs were domesticated in only 25,000 years ago. Um, and the few hundred years that essentially most of the breeds that you're seeing um, have been developed by mixing and matching and very strong selection uh, on the part of fanciers. So a very simple way to build an architecture for an otherwise very complex trait. Now, how does that relate to human health? Well, um, on this slide, I, I give you an example for two genes on the X chromosome. So this is a heat map, and across the X axis are a number of genes that we found are important in dog body size. On the Y axis um, is standard breed weight, 10 to 15 pounds, 15 to 20, so on and so forth. The red are indicates a derived allele, so one you don't see in wolves, but you can see in dogs. The yellow indicates an ancestral allele. You can see it in dogs, but you always see it in wolves. Um, by and large, if you look at little dogs, you know, five to 10 pounds, little breeds, chihuahuas, pomeranians, all those, um, they, they all have the derived allele, but that flips when you get to the X chromosome. And these last two genes are on the X chromosome. One of is a gene called IGSF4. We see that derived allele in 90% in of really big breeds, some of the medium breeds, but not the small breeds. What does the gene do? Well, it's involved in the thyroid hormone pathway. When it's mutated in humans, 
it's associated with obesity, associated with certain cancers, associated with Alport syndrome. So here's something breeders have been doing in order to make dogs of a particular aesthetic. And in doing so, they've created an opportunity to look at variation in genes um, to, together with phenotypes or traits or diseases we really care about for human health and biology. Another example, um, ACSL4. This is res responsible for back fat thickness. So you do see that in an English Mastiff. You wouldn't see it in a Great Dane. So it pops up over here on the heat map and just a subset of breeds. What does it do? It has a role in lipid biosynthesis and fatty acid degradation. When otherwise perturbed in humans, it's important in metabolic syndrome. It's important in insulin resistance. Same deal. This is something that breeders have been doing to make dogs of a particular aesthetic um, that then becomes a system um, for studying things that are important in human health as well. Now, no discussion would be complete if I didn't also talk about behavior. And you can just look at this slide and I can just say sight hound, sled dog, herding dog, pointer, draft dog, retriever, and a visualization comes immediately to mind because these are really breed stereotypic behaviors. They're by and large untrained. They're things that dogs are going to do um, no matter what. Now, I've been really interested in Border Collies. It's, in fact, the reason I started the Dog Genome Project over 30 years ago. And I've always wanted to know what makes herding dogs herd. Um, and it's, it's something that I've revisited several times over the last 30 years. But it's really been in the last couple of years when just a wonderful postdoc, Emily Dutro, joined my lab. And she tackled it in really interesting and, and novel ways with novel tools that we've been able to make some progress on this. Um, her work has been published in Cell. And again, you know, about a year and a half of, of, of work um, takes us to this slide. And Emily um, has shown that axon guidance genes, those things responsible for axon outgrowth, axon attraction, axon repulsion, are very strongly associated with that herder lineage. Now, on the bottom is another one of those Manhattan plots, and all those genes in green are things that we've shown are statistically significant, important um, in, in this herder lineage. And when we look at a, this in terms of a, a pathway presentation, um, you can see that these genes affect all different areas. Of, of axon guidance. Um, these are by and large genes that are important in, in early brain development. So truly these are things these dogs have been programmed to do um, very, very early on. So how do they work? How do they affect herding? Well, you know, we don't know for sure, <laughs> um, but as always, we have some ideas. So many of the genes are part of a efferent signaling pathway. And efferin 5, the, the signal, this has blown up the area under the curve. You can see this nice signal. Efferin 3 is to the, the far right. And again, you can see the very nice signal. Efferin 5, for instance, has 18 variants. And they're present in 77% of all border collies, but only 7% of non-border collie breeds. And that's looking at over 200 breeds. So how does that gene contribute to herding? Okay, here's our newest hypothesis. Well, we know Efren 5 and its ligand are implicated in anxiety and in maternal pup gathering in mouse models. So when it's knocked out in mice, the mothers don't gather their pups together. They, they don't pull them together into that nice tight group. So one thought is that the herding drive may involve augmentation of the same anxiety associated pathways that drive maternal protection behaviors. So we have lots and lots of functional work to do to explore that, but it's one interesting way to think about these genes. And Jamin Kim uh, published um, a couple of years before that interesting paper in PNAS and Jay Min was interested in something different. He was interested in hunting. So the sport hunting breeds, bred to assist hunters by retrieving, by flushing, by pointing, requires very prolonged periods of physical activity. Versus terrier breeds employed to rid land or buildings of vermin, requiring short, rapid bursts of activity. So how are these two things accomplished at the genetic level? Well, again, you know, a couple of years of work, and, and then he had a nice paper in PNAS. 
And he showed that there were genes important in neurologic function, um, muscle, for instance, muscle contraction, muscle mass, muscle development, and cardiovascular genes, things important in vascular smooth muscle contraction, for instance. And that's not surprising um, because, you know, several years early, Joyner and Coyle had written that elite athletic performance is largely determined by the integrative roles of muscular, cardiovascular, and neurologic functions. So let's look at a couple of examples. All right, myostatin and um, TRPN3. So um, myostatin is when it's knocked out, it dramatically increases muscle mass. And, and that's been shown in, in whippets. Um, and, and they're normally that lean, almost anorexic looking dog. And in the lower two panels, you can see these are dogs that myostatin has been knocked out and they have this very muscular appearance. Um, and that dramatically improves their racing speed essentially by an entire grade. And we went and collected samples, got racetrack reports and all those sorts of things um, in order to show that. Um, um, TRP, M3 mutations in that gene, those dogs run almost 27% faster. So a couple of genes dramatically improve racing performance. How about Robo1? This is neurologic. This was actually fun because um, we went and sampled dogs um, at obstacle courses. So we looked at number of agility trials, one by each breed versus total number of dogs registered for each breed. And remember, obstacle courses, you have to run, turn, stop, jump, these really fast, rapid movements. And then we did a case control um, uh, a candidate gene study using whole genome sequence from 92 breeds. And we, we looked at the best performing and the worst performing dogs and Robo-1 variants jumped out. They're significantly associated with breed specific agility performance. So what does the gene do? Well, it plays a role in regulation of neuronal migration and development. Hey, it's an axon guidance and growth gene. In humans, however, the genes associated with a form of developmental um, dyslexia. It's a common learning disability, and it's associated with translating visual cues. So this makes sense, right? Because in dogs, Robo-1 seems to affect the ability to identify and learn environmental information, such as obstacle courses. And each time the dog runs the course, it should get faster and faster and faster. Um, and, and that's what that gene is important for. But this is very cool because now we have a non-invasive and very simple system to match variants in the gene with the different aspects of performance. And so this is really a classic example of how we can use dogs to study these nuances of behavior in ways that inform us about what dogs are doing, but human health and biology as well. So in closing, I'll just say that, you know, there's so many other things I would have loved to tell you about. We have studies on the ground um, in Chernobyl, as you know, catastrophic accident in 1986, releasing um, radioactive cesium, iodine, plutonium, 117,000 people evacuated. Most personal belongings were left behind, including, sadly, pets. So as of 2017, there were 800 dogs that lived in and around Chernobyl, and there are dogs living in the reactor. There are families of dogs living in the spent fuel rods. Just extraordinary. So at the invitation of the Chernobyl Nuclear Power Plant Authority, um, working with, with colleagues um, in, in Ukraine, as well as the University of South Carolina, health clinics were set up to spay, neuter, vaccinate, chip, and offer medical care to these stray dogs. And so we've been able to get samples from about 400 of them. Um, and the bottom left is Gabby Spatola, graduate student in my lab at Chernobyl, collecting samples, working at one of these spay, um, neuter clinics. And so the question we want to answer is, what are the genetic changes that have occurred that allow this population of nearly 800 dogs to survive and propagate for about 15 generations in and around this nuclear power plant? And um, Gabby's published one paper so far, and she's got some great results that are coming down the pike. We study aging in dogs as do other people, wanting to understand the difference between chronological age, how many years you've lived, versus biological age, the percentage of, of how far along are you. Dogs are a great system in which to study this because some breeds live a long time, some breeds live very short times. And there's also an association with weight. Big dogs just don't live as long. The Leonbergers, the Dog de Bordeaux, again, your Neufs um, and your St. Bernards, maybe six, seven. Whereas some of these small breeds, 
toy poodles, Pomeranians, all those guys, they can easily live up into their early 20s. So um, we and other labs um, are certainly tackling that. And this is made ever more possible by a consortium that I've been leading, the Dog 10K Consortium. It's an international effort to, to generate and analyze sequence from eventually 10,000 different canids. Um, we just published our, our first paper um, in um, genome biology. Um, and it includes all different kinds of dogs. We're not limited to, to breed dogs. The idea is to allow the wider community to do some of the things you're interested in, study aging, study behavior, morphology, health, domestication, um, and conservation as well, because we've been collecting wolves and, and coyotes. And all samples are processed in the same way. We've made all of our data and processing pipelines available prior to publications, and there's now about 4,000 sequences available. So I hope I've convinced you that dogs are a fantastic opportunity to do work with the general public on a family member that they love dearly, to study the genetics of so many different things. Um, you know, numbers are an advantage. The fact that most traits are controlled by small numbers of genes are an advantage. Cancer is certainly a place where a lot of emphasis has gone as well as behavior. Um, and, and, and the Dogs of Chernobyl project is in my lab, I think one of the most interesting because it shows how dogs act as a sentinel for environmental exposures. Um, and we continue to press with this idea that data and means to analyze data should be available to everyone. So I'll stop um, talking there. Here's a recent picture of my lab plus one. You have to stare a little closely, but you can probably figure out who the, the plus one is. Um, and I'll um, take some questions. Um, if we have some time. So we do have some questions coming across that I will Great. ask you shortly. Sure. Oh, okay. We don't have them yet. What? Can I, can I, I'll ask one, sure, what, yeah. did, what did you, can you reveal some of what you found with the Chernobyl dogs as far as how they were able to um, live in that uh, environment? Yeah, so the first thing we had to do is understand their population structure because we have samples from dogs that have been living in Chernobyl city, which is about 15 kilometers away. Dogs living in Pripyat, one of the abandoned towns, it's about um, one and a half kilometers away. Um, and then dogs that are living in the reactor um, itself. And we found the dogs in the reactor pretty much stated themselves. They really don't go out and, and, and mate or cross or, or go over to Chernobyl city. Dogs from Chernobyl City have introgression from other breeds, presumably from workers that have been bringing um, dogs in. Um, they all have a, a background of, um, for instance, um, Eastern European German Shepherd, um, but the dogs inside the reactor um, don't really have much, much more than than that. Um, a little bit from some some Russian dogs, but really not much more than that. And so, what we have found is that this is a much harder problem than we thought. In our simplistic worldview, we thought, well, we'll just compare the genomes of dogs living in the reactor from dogs that don't live in the reactor. And it turns out that doesn't work because their population background is really very different. So you get all kinds of false positives, um, and it, which is very easy to do, right? I mean, you have to be so cognizant of this issue of population structure. So now what we've had to do is get dogs from um, all over Eastern Europe, which people have been great about sending us. We've gotten lots and lots from Poland. We've been sequencing those and we're using those as our control populations. Um, we've also found that when we look at the genome, we can identify lots of families. Um, because we've been collecting over several years. These dogs only live to be a couple of years old. Um, we don't know if that's the radiation exposure or that's that they live in an incredibly harsh, cold, food-deprived environment, even though the Clean Futures Fund continues to drop food off for these dogs um, every month. So we're focused on those sorts of issues to design the right experiment and figure out what the underlying genes really are. But it's turned out to be a much more complex experiment. It just highlights you, you really have to think about population structure or you can get answers you want. You can get all kinds of false positives. 
Thank you. Other um, questions? So I've learned that there are no questions on Slido. So I open it up to the other board members and speakers. If you have any questions that you would like to ask Dr. Ostrander. Go ahead, Dr. Yonker. Hi, Sonnet Yonker. Um, I'm wondering how much uh, acceptance of um, genetic engineering is uh, there is for companion animals or yeah. for, like you showed those greyhounds or- sure. uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so how, how, much, how much is that happening in, in, in dogs across various domains where you find dogs? So genetic testing, dog owners love it. Dog owners have completely embraced as we as we find genes responsible for traits. Companies scoop those up and offer genetic testing, and that's been wholly embraced by um, breeders who use it um, in order to design their breeding programs. So um, that and that's been true for a long time. Genetic engineering, not at all. So the dogs um, that uh, the whippets that that had the mutations in myostatin were actually found by accident. A breeder contacted us and said, "Look, I'm getting these weird looking whippets, and I don't know what to do about it. Um, what's going on?" And we got samples um, and looked at them, and then we went down to the racetrack and said, "Oh yeah, there are some down here, and those dogs race really, really, really well." But we haven't seen um, dog breeders then embrace that. Like we haven't seen the greyhound community say, oh, okay, we want to put that gene, um, you know, or we want to breed it in or CRISPR it into to all of our dogs so that they'll do better. Haven't seen that at all. And for sure, the American Kennel Club is very much against that sort of thing. Um, and those dogs would not be allowed to be registered, which is kind of the holy grail of the dog world. So that's where it stands right now. So as a follow-up, um, I, I, uh, I presume that the breeders are using that information to breed out disease traits. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Is there any thought about doing that um, artificially? Doing it artificially, you mean by? Uh, um, by creating dogs with, with engineered genes to prevent. Yeah. Cystic. No, they, they really haven't been doing that. You know, there's been just a flood of genetic tests coming out. And so dogs are tested. We give a lot of lectures that say, don't take anyone who's a heterozygote completely out of your breeding program because you're going to narrow your gene pool if you throw out all your heterozygotes and, you know, something else is going to pop up. So we've given a lot of educational lectures to breed clubs all over the country. And so, you know, breeders incorporate that, that information and that genetic testing into their breeding program. Um, I don't know of a situation where someone has developed a, a designer dog or a CRISPR dog um, and then use that to sort of speed up that process. Um, they always have dogs in their breeding program that they can test or someone else does in the community that doesn't have um, whatever the offending gene or offending allele is. Um, and, and so, you know, that's what, that's what they use. That's what they incorporate into their breeding programs. So I don't know of any situations like that. And again, you know, it's people talk and it's a small community and those dogs would not be able to be registered. So in that world of dog breeding, what would be the point? Yeah. Yes, hi, thank you. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, I have, uh, I'm wondering, you know, what you see as the barriers or the successes in uh, this kind of research translating over to, to human health. And th there are two specific um, examples that I, I, I've always been really interested in, but don't necessarily see that much uptake on the human side. One is the connection between the brachycephalic skull morphology and, and glioblastoma, um, which I understand is a pretty significant uh, linkage. And the other is just this uh, natural experiment of, of we, we in North America spay our female dogs as part of responsible pet owner, or at least many of us do. And I, my understanding is in Scandinavia, they don't. And that seems like a natural um, um, model for you know, mammary carcinoma uh, risk and, and breed differences. So I'm just, I guess I'm wondering with those kinds of incredibly important um, issues for human health and those kinds of almost low hanging fruit, if I can put it that way, if, are yeah. there, is it happening? And, and um, I would love to hear what you think. 
you know, the, the issue of spay and neuter, which of course is what responsible owners do um, here in the United States, um, and by and large is not done really to that degree in Europe, particularly in, in, the, in the Nordic countries. Um, we and others have started looking at, um, you know, collections of dogs from the U.S. and then looking at the same breed in Europe. So we just had a paper out on the Bernese Mountain Dog. You know, Bernese Mountain Dogs, a quarter of them are going to get hysteocytic sarcoma. All of them are going to die. Who get it? All of them are going to. Um, and so we have samples from Bern. We have samples from the U.S. And, and it, you know, following those dogs prospectively is, of course, really important just to see what these different populations are because they really haven't blended or, or you know, they really haven't haven't crossed. And so for things like, um, you know, mammary cancers and, and prostate cancers and, and things like that, this obviously becomes even more important. I don't have seen, I haven't seen papers come out about it yet, um, but I know people are thinking about it. I do have to say that in the show dog world, dogs are not spayed or neutered. So in order to be able to show your dog, they have to be intact. And then dogs who do well in dog shows, um, especially males, you can freeze hundreds of shots of sperm on these dogs, right? And you can register the progeny of artificial insemination. So one really spectacular male dog, who, for instance, wins at Westminster, can produce litter after litter after litter after litter. The good and the bad of that dog gets propagated, right? And so it's a really weird breeding structure. And we are very fortunate. The American Kennel Club has been very generous with making um, you know, you know, records available to us. And quite honestly, every breeder I think we've ever asked has given us more information about their dog's pedigree than we would ever, ever, ever imagine knowing or, or, or wanting. So those things make it a little bit more complicated because the only way to get pedigree data is using AKC registered dogs. Most of our work is done with AKC registered dogs. So most of those dogs are intact. So I think people like Eleanor Carlson at the Broad, um, who have much more of an all-comers citizen science project, are in a much better position, um, I think, to tackle um, to tackle some of those issues. You know, brachycephaly, it's, it's really interesting. This is um, something that we started in my lab, and, and the postdoc who did it now has his own lab at Edinburgh, and he continues to, to, to work on this. And I think what he's found is um, this is a hard problem because it's a multigenic problem like anything out there. This isn't going to be a single one-off story. Um, but, you know, you see these associations between morphologic traits um, and, and diseases, and, you know, they're all over the dog world. And the degree to which it's an association or it's causative um, can be very difficult to figure out. And so I think that's where several of, of these sorts of things are at. Okay. Go ahead, Caroline. Um, hi, Caroline Zeiss. Hi. Um, you know, so dogs have been very successful preclinical models for some human diseases. They've yeah. actually the approval of certain drugs for people. Um, now that you've discovered all of these candidate genes, um, do you see much appetite for those being used to create research colonies, which really takes the dog out of the citizen science realm and puts it back squarely as a preclinical laboratory animal species? Um, no, <laughs> in short, I'm going to say, no, I don't. So, um, you know, in some cases, we, they're not candidates that we have actually found the underlying mutation. I mean, you know, BRAF is a good example in bladder cancer, um, where, you know, most dogs have a mutation in, in BRAF in their, in their tumors. It's a somatic mutation. So it becomes a really good target for, for treatment. So what we hear um, veterinarians and oncologists saying to us is, oh, okay, this gene, what's known about it in, in human health? And then let's go ahead and set up trials um, and, and look at this in our clinic patients, in, in dogs who are really appropriate to be enrolled. Now, I'm not a clinician, um, and so I know that that's a broad statement. It comes with lots of caveats, but there are clinical trial networks um, in, in the dog world. Um, Amy LeBlanc runs one of them for, for cancer with a big emphasis um, on um, glioblastomas and other similar cancers. And these are, are none, of, none of these are 
colonies that are being developed um, and, and bred and then used um, for, for doing these sorts of clinical trials. The idea has really been to keep it in the realm of citizen science. Will that change, you know, as, as certain genes are found or certain diseases are, are tackled? I, you know, I don't, I, you know, I don't know. Um, but for now, there's really been an emphasis for really the One Health approach, which I know other people will talk much more eloquently about than I possibly could, um, and, and, and making use of data and drugs that are, are out there for treatment of humans and seeing what would apply best to the dog situation. Hey, Dr. Ostrander, I've got one last question for you, and this is coming from uh, the ether. Um, the All of Us program is exhibiting here at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Any thought of studying pet dogs of the people in that study as a comparative exposure? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> we absolutely, we absolutely have talked to the All of Us program um, for exactly that reason. You know, wherever they are, we want to get samples of the dogs for sure. And figuring out how to make it happen, um, you know, we're not there yet. Um, but I think everybody recognizes the the benefit of doing that. And I'll just say in closing, um, you know, we collect dogs from all over the world. I have a slide I didn't put up, world map, ev everywhere you can imagine. Um, but if you have an interesting dog or an interesting breed, send, send, send me an email, contact me. And right now we're very interested in collecting dogs from Africa, which is really underrepresented in all of our studies. So if you have connections there for us or veterinarians you know there, please contact us as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Ostrander. We really appreciate it. Well, welcome back, everyone. We are now in our post-lunch um, session of um, the Basker meeting, and we are really excited to um, now feature five phenomenal uh, panelists who will be um, speaking to us on a, a pretty wide range of topics that all are part of Basker. And um, follow, following their, uh, their presentations, we're gonna have a, a conversation together, a discussion. So please use the um, uh, Slido to um, send us your questions and, um, and we'll have a conversation afterwards. So we will, um, I should say, we will have room time for maybe one or two quick questions between speakers, but most of the, the denser part of the conversation will happen afterwards. So with that, um, let me um, direct your attention to um, the list of speakers for this afternoon. Um, I should mention that an earlier version of this, there were some errors. So we wanna make sure that everyone um, sees the speakers. I think I'll just um, quickly review who we have. Um, today we have um, Dr. Claire Hankinson, University of Pennsylvania, uh, Cynthia Smith, National Marine Mammal Foundation, Tracy Goldstein, One Health Institute at CSU, Steve Osofsky, Cornell Wildlife Health Center at Cornell, and Rowena Watson um, from the US Department of State. And uh, we will start with um, our first speaker who uh, will be um, Dr. Hankinson speaking on perspectives on the care and welfare of research animals. Let me um, offer a brief bio um, on her. Will this stay on? Yeah. There it is. All right. Um, she is a um, veterinarian and associate um, vice provost for research and executive director of the University Laboratory Animal Resources at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, she's an attending veterinarian um, and faculty uh, position and faculty member at the uh, Professor of Laboratory Animal Medicine within the department of pathobiology at the School of Veterinary Medicine there. Uh, she obtained her veterinary degree from Purdue, completed her graduate work and residency at University of Washington, and then became a diplomat of the American College of Laboratory um, Animal Medicine. Uh, she has many professional um, connections and associations and lots and lots of leadership. I think I'll um, end the bio and turn things over um, to 
Dr. Hankinson, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just gonna move to screen share and hopefully all the tech, oh, I can't, there we go. I'll try again, there we go. Right off. Okay. Great. Um, thank you so much. It is really an honor to be here, and I am delighted to have this opportunity to present at the inaugural launch of ASKER and to be with all of my colleagues here. Um, I am getting a join audio. Do I need to do that? Okay, I will X that out. Thank you. All right. Um, so first and foremost, these are, I guess, the, the, the requisite disclaimer. Um, these are views that represent my own here today and are based upon many years of reflection and discussion with colleagues that are veterinarians, animal care staff, IACUC professionals, committee members, and scientists. And when we had our planning call, the request was to share some degree of history around animal welfare. And then as panelists, we were each asked in our own disciplines to touch on some of the current and future challenges. Uh, and I'll be incorporating those throughout the slides. There we go. All right, so I thought since I am talking about research animals, uh, it would be helpful to start with a definition. And so what we have here is really any vertebrate animal, this is um, how it's defined in the regulations, any vertebrate animal, uh, traditional laboratory animals, ag, wildlife, aquatic species, et cetera, that are produced for or used in research, teaching, testing, or production medicine. You may notice that I have a non-vertebrate on the far right, if anyone was doing a little um, inspection there, but that's because because cephalopods are becoming more and more important in our global discussion around coverage of species. Scientists use animals to learn more about health problems that affect both humans and animals, and we use them to assure the safety of new medical treatments. Some of these problems involve processes that can only be studied in living organisms, and when we don't have an alternative, uh, we would use laboratory animals or animals in research to um, meet, meet objectives. And many of the animals that I work with personally in my world are bred specifically for use in research. So I wanted to touch on the three R's. I'm hoping most of our audience is familiar with the three R's of replacement, reduction, and refinement. These were developed um, some 50 years ago now as a framework for humane animal research. They have subsequently become embedded in national and international legislation regulating the use of animals in scientific procedures. Opinion polls show that they are incredibly important across the world for people when they think about the public in particular, the use of animals in investigations. Today, the three R's are increasingly seen as a foundation for conducting high quality science and they have evolved in terminology and I wanna thank NC3Rs for having this available on their website. So what were relatively, um, brief pronouncements and definitions around what these three words mean. Um, they've become much more expanded, uh, progressive and applicable still um, in our world today. And so I direct anyone who would like to learn more about those specifically, I'll refer to them again throughout the talk, but um, you, can, you can find much more at the NC3R's website. So when they came out in 1959, I, and in the spirit of sharing a little bit of history around animal welfare, um, there were a lot of concepts that came after the three R's. And it's important to emphasize these, I feel, because they synergize closely with the three R's. So first, the five freedoms, um, they were uh, released in 1965 in the UK. They outlined five aspects of animal welfare that are under human control. Uh, the UK government wanted these to really focus on livestock husbandry, and they didn't actually get formalized until about 1979, so quite a long time before adoption by the UK Farm Animal Welfare Council. The government principles were released in 1985. I'll give a little more detail about those. They were nine incredibly impactful statements. Um, they came out, they're, they're available if anyone is interested in looking at them in the guide and they can also be looked at online. Um, so I'll come back to those, but that was 1985, which is a really important year uh, that I'll return to. Some additional um, concepts around the three R's were looking at the sex as a biological variable and they coined the four C's at that time. 
And since then, we've had the concept of the three Vs, validation, um, construct validity, scientific validity, internal validity. Um, this was a paper that came out uh, just a few years ago as well to think really about the harm benefit analysis and our role in that um, decision making process. I'll come back to, as far as a challenge, just to put a star here for us to put a pin in it, um, I'll come back to the sex of the biological variable. Um, just for a, a little bit of brevity on that, if people haven't been aware of that before, women now account for about half of all participants in NIH-supported clinical research. However, more often than not, basic and preclinical biomedical research has focused on male animals and cells. So this was an effort in order to account for sex as a biological variable with the development of research questions and study designs to reflect that. So as I mentioned, it was incredibly important to have the nine U.S. government principles, and I, I want to take a, a moment to go through them um, because they are now 40-some years old um, or about 40 years old. Um, and there, I, I hope everyone will agree with me as I go through these. These are still really important aspects of animal welfare and challenges that we are addressing across our country um, within our discipline, and I'm sure many others as well um, will we'll touch on this today. How we transport our animals and making sure that we adhere to the guidelines and policies and laws, uh, compliance overall. Any procedure that uses an animal should consider the relevance to human and animal health and advancing knowledge and the good of society. So that harm benefit analysis was, was um, very prominent again in 1985 when these were coined. We want to avoid or minimize um, discomfort, distress and pain. So this is very much in the spirit of refinement. Um, we want to make sure we have the most recent technologies and innovations for our drug um, interventions. And with the respect to reduction, we wanna consider the minimum number of animals that will answer the question and also consider, consider alternatives that are non-animals. Back to veterinary um, approaches, we want to make sure the drugs are modern and uh, um, useful, effective. And euthanasia of animals, which is um, an constant part of the work that we do as veterinarians, as veterinary technicians in the veterinary world, um, we want to make sure that we're using the appropriate methods to do that as well, to limit any excessive pain or suffering. Veterinarians are expected to be involved in these decisions and looking at sort of environments and enrichment for the animals. And we absolutely need to make sure that people working with the animals are trained to do so. And then the last, which I'll, uh, which was really, really, uh, a major change to what had happened before the government principles came out was the establishment of the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. So the decisions around these nine principles was not to rest just with scientists alone, but it should have been a, a stakeholder group, if you will, that would review um, the work with the animals. So to give a quick overview for the IACUC, um, as I mentioned, 1985 was when this came into play. It's become its own um, entire career path in and of itself. I think many people are probably aware of that. Um, we look at all of the animal use activities and any changes to those activities. We ensure compliance with animal use procedures, and there's a lot of language around post-approval monitoring now. We will look at reviewing the facilities and program every, uh, every six months. We make sure that there is a robust training program, not only for the IACUC members themselves, but also anyone who works with animals. And we are reviewing care uh, concerns about the care and use of animals at all times. And, and very importantly, balancing the, um, the use of animals, the welfare of animals with the research um, or project outcomes and objectives. And the IACUC uh, has a lot of flexibility built, baked into it, even though it is supposed to be following and does follow so many regulations. And I'll explain how this has gotten more complex over time. Um, but there's been some critiques around the fact that ICUCs are not consistent in their deliberations and they are not consistent because they're made up of different people um, between institutions. And there's a little bit of a concern that we are heavily expecting them to be the arbiters of all things ethical. Um, but I just want to make sure that as we go forward in this discussion, um, and I do sit on um, more than one IACUC myself, um, the IACUC was never meant to be the, the ethical body completely for animal science and scientific merit. So um, again, just, just to, as we have the conversations today, um, there are many, many people at the table that have a voice and opinion in that. And we want the scientific 
community to be aware of um, how we balance the harm and benefit for animal use. This has even led to additional many papers. This is just one of them by my colleague, Stacey Pritt, about how ethics, animal welfare, and the oversight can help with, uh, with overview and reproducibility of animal studies. So getting information about how we are going to take care of animals. Um, we have numerous textbooks. Most of these are in the lab animal um, medicine and laboratory animal science field, as well as dedicated scientific journals that are specific to our discipline as well. Um, and we have our main book is called the laboratory animal, just laboratory animal medicine. Um, we have the fourth edition that's underway right now. Chapters are hopefully being written as we speak because I'm an editor and I need people to get their chapters in. Um, so anyone who's out there, just kidding. Um, and then of course, as I mentioned, it's gotten more complex for IACUX because we have so many regulations to follow and these are all important and critical um, now in for uh, large animal species. The USDA has Animal Welfare Act, there's inspection guides, the public health service policy, wildlife um, guidance as well all very useful, but a lot of information for, for us to have to follow as we're taking care of animals every day. So I wanna take a moment to touch on the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals. Um, I know that the um, next edition, which I think will be the 12th, if it's still called an edition when it comes out, um, but it would be, sorry, it would be the ninth, excuse me. Is that right? The ninth, yes. Um, the ninth edition um, is, is a, really important document in the world of working with research animals. And um, there's been a discussion ongoing that I um, got permission to share a little bit, sort of hot off the press news. And this this will be coming out in um, a publication soon, hopefully, by this group. They're the Veterinary Consortium for Research Animal Care and Welfare. And their mission um, that they had hoped to accomplish was to provide accurate information about the care and use of research animals in order to inform the public and as well as regulators in the scientific community about veterinary care and welfare for the species. So this became um, apparent from different groups that work in laboratory animal science and medicine. Um, and I'll mention here that there are representatives uh, from ACLAM, which is the American College of Lab Animal Medicine, uh, Laboratory Animal Practitioners, ALAS, which is our National Lab Animal Science Meeting, and um, the Primate Veterinarian Group, as well as we have consultation from the National um, Association for Biomedical Research with Dr. Taylor Bennett, who also is a laboratory animal veterinarian. They conducted a survey over last year and into this year, and the information that I'm going to share with you was just presented at one of our ACLAM forum meetings a couple of months ago. So what they asked was a series of questions um, and really was, I'm not gonna go into all those details so that you can wait and read that in the publication that comes out, but they wanted to find out from interviewing the survey respondents where they thought uh, some changes should be made into the next edition of the guide. Um, and so just to break this apart um, and mention to folks, so chapter three and chapter two were the top areas that were suggested to be most in need of revision. And for those who maybe don't have the guide memorized to the extent of the chapters themselves, the chapter two is the animal care and use program. Chapter three is environment, housing and management. Um, chapter four is veterinary care. Chapter five is physical plant. And chapter one is really kind of an introductory key concept chapter. So there's a there's a division here where most of the requests for revision are coming into those um, those chapters two and three. And when this was broken down farther across the top ten things that came out from the survey, um, it was related to how the animals are housed, the enrichment that they have, and the behavioral and social management. Um, just thinking about, for example, how large should a cage be? How tall should a cage be? Um, what different types of substrates will help to promote species specific behaviors? Um, there's also aspects of husbandry, the um, operations of the HVAC, which is um, the facility systems, ventilation and air conditioning. Um, and then for aquatics as well, this was interesting because we don't have very much in the current guide and there's a request to have more. So one of the, um, just in the, the general data that I was um, given to share, there are about 531 responses to an option for open-ended questions. And there were 200 some references added in that should be um, 
folks believe should be included in the next version of the guide. And so I wanted to just focus on this a bit. Um, the, the number of respondents increased from left to right here. The topics um, that, that were hit were marked um, as being increasing as you head from left to right. Um, but I wanted to emphasize, which I think is really important for us today, that there is a request to have more species and to look at wildlife and field studies and agriculture and aquatics, as we mentioned. In addition, compliance, uh, there's a lot of questioning around the mays, the musts, the shoulds, and how we interpret those. And I'll come back to this, but mental health as a component of working in veterinary medicine um, is also really a really important topic right now, um, a public health topic as well. And I'll explain a little bit about that as we go forward. So I think this is just interesting. It's informative. And I, I know that all of these groups are really excited and interested to see the progress that will be made um, from the standing committee for the next guide. So I wanted to just talk a bit about the challenge. So I think in my role about what it will be like to incorporate the changes that are going to come in the next guide and it makes me kind of uh, have to, you know, not have a little bit of a panic attack. Um, so change management. We have been living through change management now for several years um, and dealing with COVID. And it, when the guide comes, it is going to be transformational. And I'm just taking very high level definitions from the Harvard Business School. Um, very large in scale and scope. Um, incredibly important in shifting how we think about our mission. There's going to need to be a lot of strategy, et cetera. So when we think about that wide of a change, I thought it'd be um, useful to discuss a smaller change. And I thought I'd go back to the concept of sex as a biological variable. Um, these, are, these are things that hopefully, you know, this was just supposed to be one initiative from the NIH, for example, um, that uh, several years ago was thought to be something relatively easy to fix. You're using a lot of males, just start using a lot of females and um, in, in your studies, no matter what the species and everything will kind of shake out from there. So again, just for a little bit of background on this, um, as I mentioned, women are approximately 50% of participants in clinical research. Um, but if we bring that back into preclinical work, um, we just have not been seeing the same number of female animals used as male animals. Um, and I'll just, I'll just quote a little bit from this initiative. So adequate consideration of both sexes and experiments and disaggregation of data by sex allows for sex-based comparisons and may inform clinical interventions. NIH at the time that they released this expected that sex as a biological variable would begin to be factored into biological design, analyses, reporting in vertebrate animal and human studies. Strong justification from the scientific literature, preliminary data, or other relevant considerations must be provided for applications that would propose to use only one sex. Investigators are strongly encouraged to discuss these issues with NIH program staff prior to submission. So we um, have gotten past the five-year mark on this, and a paper came out to look at how well things had gone. Um, at the time of the guidance development, there was a lot of resistance to this. Um, the, the implementation of a sex and gender policies, um, there was a lack of awareness about the importance, a lack of belief that this mattered, um, and ultimately uh, challenges just to have it launch at all. Um, good things that, that have come out, the guidance is now in six languages. There is a much greater number of journals, many greater number of journals that have adopted this, and it's used, it is being used extensively by researchers. But we still have some critical barriers um, that I'll talk about here. So this is this is just a template that's come out for how a reviewer for a, a funding agency would look at whether someone has included appropriately sex as a biological variable. We will not be tested on this. This is just to show the complexity of it, but. There remain concerns about mandating this because of financial expectations. I remember when this came out, there were a lot of researchers that said, I don't have the money to do this in my grants. And will I get more money to basically duplicate the experiments with uh, this, the other sex? Time burdens of repeating those experiments. Obviously, we had graduate students, postdocs, people that had to move on with their careers um, that wouldn't be able to repeat things. Um, I mentioned a resistance or a lack of awareness amongst um, scientists as well, grant reviewers. A lot of people just didn't think it had been so seeded for so long that um, there were impacts if we used females um, that would be biased into the experiments that it was, it was difficult to overcome that sort of what was ingrained culturally. And unfortunately, what we're seeing um, 
uh, is a persistent underrepresentation of both sexes. So despite it being several years now, it's it's still ongoing. Um, and I thought it'd be useful to just quote something. Um, this is a, a, an editorial that came out in uh, 2019 by Rebe- Rebecca Shansky in Science. Um, she said, the notion that a woman's disposition is a direct product of the activity in her ovaries persists today. Women, but not men, are still pejoratively described as hormonal or emotional, which curiously neglects the well-documented fact that men also possess both hormones and emotions. So I will stop there. It's a very good editorial. I would recommend it as I'm looking up at Abraham Lincoln staring down at me on the wall today. Yes. Um, But importantly in this, this um, longstanding culture that women are more complicated, men are more simple, um, has infiltrated into animal research so that male subjects are going to be easier to work with and less complex than if you introduce the um, variabilities of of, um, the female sex. And therefore it's impacting preclinical research to the point that it's impacting uh, clinical research and is deemed to be a public health concern at this point. So as we move forward then, are we looking enough outside of the science at the animals themselves? And as a veterinarian, um, this is just what I wanted to end um, the the next few slides of the talk on. So we've continued to have many, many advancements in the care and quality of life for research animals. And I wanna talk specifically about the care we have for the animals um, and the welfare. Uh, the, The work that we do is conducted by caring and devoted staff who want the best quality of life possible for these animals. And it makes good sense because if we have animals that are enriched, Um, and are healthy, then they should provide better or the best scientific data. But I wanna make sure that we we touch on the fact that these two should get attention and certainly the next version of the guide and and further regulations will help with this. Uh, We get a lot of criticism around the three Rs who cite that there's inherent harm to animals. That's a fallout somehow of of even rolling them in studies or a limited ethical review by the IACUC. Um, But to that critique, we have to respond with data and facts about the information gains that have been made in veterinary science and the involvement of veterinarians in virtually every aspect of contemporary animal use uh, for research purposes. So for those who are on the call or in the room that are not veterinarians, when we graduate, we are expected to take this oath. And I just want to highlight one of the things we're expected to do is promote public health. We are also expected to advance medical knowledge for animals and humans. And we have an ethical component to this as well. And what I liked when I've used this many times in talking to students and veterinary students, undergrads over the years, but now too, um, with, with the launch of this board, the conservation of animal resources is also a mandate for us. And within the research realm, we must have veterinarians. There have to be at least one qualified veterinarians and registered veterinary technicians or nurses in order to implement the veterinary care program. We are there to help with disease prevention. We are there to guide and consult with researchers who maybe don't have the veterinary background, always promoting animal well-being. And we work with the American Veterinary Medical Association. Many of us are members of that. That's the overarching veterinary guidance uh, group in the country who put forth the euthanasia guidelines. I wanted to touch briefly on our college. So the American College of Lab Animal Medicine is the specialty organization um, for which laboratory animal veterinarians are um, given certification. And at this time, it's one of the oldest specialties in veterinary medicine. We do a certifying of the exam, we do training programs and um, people can get into residency programs annually. Um, I just got this, uh, these numbers yesterday from Dr. Mel Bach, who is our executive director. We have over 1200 active uh, lab animal vets now and 46 ACLAM recognized residency programs around the country, including at my institution, including at Dr. Disco's institution and um, I think at Dr. Brayden's institution as well. Um, So one of the challenges that we're seeing that um, is of concern is a workforce issue. Um, It was wonderful to have uh, Elaine kicking off the conversation today about how many dogs are in our country. I don't, I won't even ask for a show of hands how many people got a pet during the pandemic because there might be, um, we'd have a a unanimous here. Um, But the challenges are still continuing to be a domino effect from that in that um, veterinarians were overloaded, clinics were overloaded, the need for veterinarians has driven the salary price points in practice to an extent where 
I have had residents recently say, although I've done an extra four years of training, I have too many um, debt burdens here. I am going to go into practice because now I'm going to be paid a lot more and I'm going to get a signing bonus, et cetera. This is happening not only in the lab animal specialty, this is happening in multiple specialties. Um, and it's disconcerting. Um, this this uh, straight talk about um, workforce issues came from the AVMA summer meeting from the president of the AVMA saying, it's tough now it's going to get better. So we have uh, three veterinary schools that will be, that are, that have just come online that are going to be um, graduating students in the next couple of years. And shockingly to me, 10 more veterinary schools that are proposed, um, which will take care of the workforce issue and potentially start to bring down some of the temperature on how everyone's concerned that we don't have enough support. Talking about animal subjects themselves, um, this is something that I think is really critical because it's a critique of the three R's when we say that we're going to be reducing um, animal numbers to zero. Animal rights groups would like to see no animals in research, but we still have so much to learn about all these animals. Um, this is just a sampling of the species that are, are here. Um, and, and again, to, to the talk this morning about bats, I mean, just we have, it's just fascinating. We, we have to make sure that we are rebuffing the societal pressure to reduce animal numbers and replace all animals from study. Studying animals for the sake of animals is a key consideration for many research proposals. And these are the goals that are enmeshed in the progressive three R's. We do a lot of veterinary research. We need to learn more about animals' behavioral requirements in both the talks this morning, um, how much we have yet to learn about behavior. And we have veterinarians that are involved in that. We need evidence-based improvements for all of these areas. So I just, I won't belabor this because we're running a little bit short on time, um, but I, I do want to remind everyone, if you're asked, if someone says to you at some point, well, you shouldn't be using more animals, we're supposed to be using less to abide by the three R's, that's actually not the spirit of what the contemporary um, definitions are. We want to advance, if you see at the bottom here, advance animal welfare by using the latest technologies and understanding the impact of welfare. So how do we tell the public about it? Um, we're working on openness initiatives. Um, there have been articles about this. Openness has been happening in multiple countries around the world. We are a little bit late to the game, but um, I've been involved in the US Animal Research Openness in Initiative for the last few years. They have a great new website that just has launched. I hope people will take a look at it um, where you can learn more about it. And we're trying to drive the public to this as well. Um, in addition, in trying to explain to the public the importance of the work we do, I've been a part of launching the What If campaign. This is just launched this fall, where advocacy groups have worked with academic sites to come out with little um, icons, really. What if we, what if we didn't have animals in research? What if it stopped tomorrow? How would that look? What would happen? And they're for fish, they're for monkeys, they're for rats, they're for um and basic science as well. Um, this is easy to sign up for. I can help anybody get access to these. It's a partnership between the Americans for Medical Progress, the Foundation for Biomedical Research, States United for Biomedical Research. We have to counteract misinformation with fact, and we have to do it in a little bit of a scare tactic way is what we decided. We have to get on social media. We have to let people know um, that there would be huge downsides if we did away with animals and research. And in that spirit of uh, what would we do with Nobel Prize winning um, work? Well, here's a list of all of the different Nobel prizes that came about from animal work, including what has just, we've just come off the heels of all the announcements and the mRNA vaccine um, as well in 2023. The last thing I just wanna to touch on because we're finally talking about is that mental health piece. And this is a welfare issue for people that work with the animals, but also for the animals themselves, because we need healthy people to work with animals to keep them healthy. Um, I was really excited in a good way to see that David Grimm took this um, to science where he writes for them and talked about caring for research animals as a mental health toll. Um, it really gave it a lot of, um, a lot of optics and a lot of press. Um, for those who maybe aren't aware of this term, Compassion fatigue, it affects up to 86% of lab animal workers at some point in their career. It does not matter your gender, it does not matter your age, um, and it does not matter if you care for a monkey or a mouse. It is a, a major piece of what we have to do because we are spending so much of our time 
having to euthanize animals. Here is just a, a quick definition. Um, it's a low level chronic clouding of caring concern because you are having your compassion eroded, <laughs> not just veterinarians, also nurses, people in the medical field as well. Um, so we are addressing this in many ways. Um, at my institution, we are pushing for a culture of care. Um, and this is something that the article also talked about. We have a lot of great guidance from the University of Washington that was highlighted in that article. Um, and we've gone so far at my institution as to actually post a culture of care uh, statement on the front of every animal facility that people are walking into, because I hate to say sometimes we aren't really good to one another, even in the facility spaces post COVID, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of tension, there's a lot of anger. And um, in order to treat people well, who do what they do every day, um, it, it, it serves as a, a moment of pause for that. And what I do try to remind are the teams who maybe get down about what they're doing every day, having to sometimes euthanize animals that they've cared deeply for in a research setting is that there is a bigger picture. We're doing this for um, the benefit of um, others, those who need treatments. Um, there's a lot of support out in the advocacy world as well. And I think these are sometimes the highlights. So with that, um, since I'm launching into the next, the, for the rest of the panel, I'm really proud to have been a part of this today. Partnership is going to be incredibly important um, for Basker as it goes forward. Um, I really like the new website, so I just wanted to do a quick plug for this, the mission statement. Um, and, and I think there's just going to need to be a lot of people at the table. I'm excited to see the expansion of ILAR after 70 years. So with that, I will conclude. Thank you so much. Thank you for that truly wonderful and, and illuminating talk. Um, I, we have time for right now only one or two questions and just gonna just put it out there. And um, if anything has come through, if, if nothing has come through the portal, then we'll take from the group, but. Okay. So it's open to questions from people sitting at the table. Hi, Caroline Zeiss, Yale. Um, you know, we have found that putting uh, the pressure onto an IA cook to assess the science puts them in a very difficult position. And in the end, the, the statement from the researchers and the IA cook is, well, it's already been funded. And yet we see all kinds of uh, irreproducible science happening. So it's everyone's problem and nobody's problem. What is your thought on that? So I, I really appreciate that. Um, I was fortunate enough to sit on the recent working group for NIH on rigor and reproducibility. And um, there was an interesting amount of expectation that the IACA could just sort of solve all the problems. And at some point, uh, I remember one of the research members of the panel said, well, we'll just put a statistician on every IACA. I, I can't, you know, I can't imagine. And even the statisticians, I, I mean, they're all gonna view things differently. Um, they're gonna use different techniques and approaches to look at things. So I think we have unfairly pressured the IACUCs, which is a little bit about why I wanted to put that article to show that it's there There needs to be some balance around that. IACUCs were never designed to be that, um, to be that decider of what's appropriate science. I also want to offer, I took, I took this slide out in the interest of time, but because we have people at every level working with the animals, we're never gonna have reproducibility. And it's something that um, we can set up every experiment to be exactly the same, same bedding, same enrichment, same water, change on the same schedule on every day, but the people change. And there's a really interesting body of literature that's coming out about how animals respond to people as they walk into the room, people that have interacted with them either positively or negatively, observer bias of animals, um, pheromones, the odor of male experimenters. Um, we, we will never get to reproducibility. So my counter to your question, which is really important is let's stop focusing on irreproducibility and let's focus more on generalizability. And that was a term that came out of that working group that we can generally apply because the human population isn't uh, perfectly aligned. We get all, I mean, just again, like we saw in the dog population, we get all kinds of information that can be generally applied. And that is still good information. Yeah. 
I think we should probably move on and then we'll return to, I'm sure people have lots and lots of questions. So our next speaker is um, Cynthia Smith from the National Marine Okay. Yeah, but, okay. Oops, that was came off. The, sorry about that. Um, it's not in the new version. One second. Here it is. Wait, can you do me favor? Can I read off of yours? Because mine is it's the old version. I think I have it right here. Oh, sorry, just been gotcha. Thank you. All right. So apologies. So um, Dr. Smith is a veterinarian, DVM, and, and is president and CEO of the National Marine Mammal Foundation, um, it, which is based in San Diego, California. Um, she has led this organization since 20, 2010 and served as the chief medical officer for more than a decade. Um, she is involved in a number of uh, projects involving marine mammals, um, at-risk, threatened, and critically endangered cetaceans, a variety of them, has more than 25 years of uh, clinical and research experience. Um, she has contributed as a lead veterinarian for NOAA's Natural Resource Damage Assessment um, of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, which we'll be hearing about today, and studying the long-term impacts. She has many uh, associations, um, just a few. Um, she's the general program manager. She served as a general program manager for the consortium of the Vaquita Conservation Recovery um, and Protection um, and has been involved with the US Navy's Marine Mammal Program. You're gonna be hearing about some of that. Um, she received her bachelor's of science degree at Texas A&M, uh, her DVM uh, at Tufts with uh, her thesis on aquatic biomedicine, and she completed executive education at Harvard Business School, Harvard Kennedy School, and Berkeley's Haas School of Business. So we are excited to hear from you. Thank you. Okay, um, it's really a pleasure to be here. So thank you for the invitation. It's a wonderful setting. It's very inspirational just in itself to be here. Um, in Washington and then here um, in this building. So um, as you mentioned, in addition to being a leader for our nonprofit, I am a veterinarian and I specialize in marine mammal medicine, science and conservation. And so I'll be focusing today on a very different topic than our last one. Um, and it's this concept of applying uh, Navy dolphin medicine, and I'll explain what that is to conservation medicine for small cetaceans. And to really demonstrate this concept, um, I'm gonna walk us through the case study of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill and very specifically the marine mammal injury assessment. So it's important to recognize the teams of scientists and veterinarians that have been involved in this um, investigation since 2010, and it began with NOAA's uh, Natural Research Dam assess Damage Assessment, or NERDA. And that was followed by a multi-institutional and multi-agency collaboration looking into the health impacts of the spill on wild dolphins and whales, uh, which was funded by the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative, or GOMRI. This effort resulted in the creation of a scientific consortium for advancing research on marine mammal health assessments or CARMA. And it involved 12 different organizations, more than 12, including nonprofits, government agencies, veterinary hospitals, zoological organizations, and academic institutions. And then that gets us up till today. The Deepwater Horizon investigation is still continuing. And the University of St. Andrews, specifically Dr. Peter Tyak, is leading a large effort funded by CERDIP and the Office of Naval Research. And it's aimed at studying the cumulative effects of multiple stressors on marine mammals, and in this case, uh, previous oil exposure. And so there's been years of rigorous science that have gone into this issue. And I really wanna acknowledge everyone involved from the bench top, those that don't actually get to see the animals that they're working so hard to protect and understand um, all the way to the floating veterinary clinics that we pop up to study these um, incidents and in animals. So before we dive into the case study, I'll just give you a really quick um, 
snippet on the National Marine Mammal Foundation, our organization, which is a 501c3 nonprofit based in San Diego uh, with a field station in Charleston, South Carolina. We have around 150 staff, including veterinarians, scientists, conservation experts, educators, and animal care specialists. Our mission is to improve and protect life for marine mammals, humans, and the oceans through science, service, and education. As part of the mission of service, that service piece, we provide direct support to the U.S. Navy's Marine Mammal Program. This program has been around for more than 60 years. The Navy has been caring for a group of bottlenose dolphins and has been sustaining that population through, when needed, through a very successful bre breeding program. And these animals live in San Diego Bay and then from, uh, excuse me, swim freely in the open ocean during training sessions um, in the Bay and beyond. Our nonprofit provides the medical training research and even environmental stewardship uh, support to the Navy's Marine Mammal Program and specifically is looking to create science to inform the Navy on how to most responsibly navigate and operate in the ocean environment and how to best protect marine mammals. So we do a lot of different things uh, for the Navy, but I wanna focus today on the medical side um, and the scientific side of the house. So the Navy uh, has had a rich history of contributing science to marine mammal, to the field of marine mammal medicine and conservation with over 1200 peer reviewed publications since its inception. Our organization, um, is only about 15 years old and we've contributed more than 300 so far. So it really speaks to the openness of uh, this program in collaboration and into making sure that the animals are contributing in a meaningful way to the advancement of science. Pictured in the middle uh, is Dr. Sam Ridgway. Some of you may recognize him. He has um, really been a force or was a force of nature. Uh, he was the father of marine mammal medicine. He sat on multiple committees for the National Academies of Science. Uh, we lost him last year, but his impact will certainly be felt for decades. All right, so let's get to the case study. Um, so to fully demonstrate what we mean by applying Navy medicine to conservation medicine, we're gonna walk through this event and we have to go back to April, 2010 to do so. The explosion of the Deepwater Horizon drilling platform, the collapse of the rig, and then the subsequent, subsequent flow of oil resulted in the release of millions of barrels of oil in the Northern Gulf of Mexico. Oil spread to more than a thousand miles of coastline from the western uh, Louisiana coast to the Florida Panhandle. And the total volume of oil released was about 12 times more than the Exxon Valdez. The surface oil footprint, which you can see here in this map on the left, overlapped with the known ranges of 21 species of dolphins and whales in the northern Gulf of Mexico. Previously, scientists really didn't think that the animals uh, would be affected by oil. They thought they would avoid it, but this did not prove to be true. And over a thousand animals were seen uh, visually documented swimming through the oil. Uh, and this included 10 species of dolphins and whales. There was no evidence of avoidance. We believe that cetaceans, uh, which are porpoises, dolphins, and whales, might actually be more, uh, more sensitive to the negative impacts of oil products coming off of um, different types of oil, oil spills. And this is due to their very unique physiology. Dolphins, for example, have a straight and rapid intake of surrounding air directly into their lungs without the benefit of protective cilia or nasal turbinates. They also have about a 90% exchange of deep lung air with every breath. And when they dive, they come to the surface, exhale first, and then they inhale, and then they dive. So while they're swimming around, they're holding on to that, to that air. They also have double layer capillary beds. And all of these things uh, we think may increase their susceptibility uh, to oil and to chemical con contamination in the environment. So NOAA's investigative teams after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill used a variety of methods to assess the potential impact of the oil spill on different groups of marine mammals. 
oceanic species, coastal species, and bay sound and estuary species. So I'm going to be speaking to uh, my personal involvement as one of the lead veterinarians on the investigation and to our organization's involvement, uh, which we've been studying the impacts uh, since it happened in 2010. Our primary focus has been on Barataria Bay, Louisiana. This was one of the heaviest oiled bays in the Northern Gulf and uh, really has been uh, the place where we go back to really understand the long-term impacts of this spill. The marine mammal veterinary community as a whole was called upon to apply all that we had uh, learned from either animals in human care, from um, in our organization's case, from the Navy's marine mammals or to wild animals in different, in different settings, and then applying those uh, to the very rapid assessment of the wild dolphins living in Barataria Bay. We did this through catch and release health assessments. And uh, over the first four years of the investigation, we handled more than 150 wild dolphins and did full physical exams. And you can see the list of the different tests that we did. All of these tests were worked out with animals in human care, specifically um, in our case, again, with the Navy's marine mammals. So these photos were taken from our floating laboratory during one of these catch and release health assessment studies. So I'm gonna fast forward through the four years of very um, long and uh, long and productive discussions and a lot of scientific investigation uh, to really understand what, if any impact the spill had on the animals. And we went in again with um, the thinking that perhaps there would be none. And we were um, proven wrong. There was there were quite a lot of negative impacts that we were documenting in the Barataria Bay dolphins in particular. So the key findings were first that the dolphins, Barataria Bay dolphins, were determined to be in poor health relative to other wild dolphin populations. And the next slide we'll talk more specifically about that. Second, in the aftermath of the spill, there was one of the largest unusual mortality events on record to date that happened um, in the four years following. So animals were not only washing up dead and then being examined um, uh, for evidence of exposure, but we also had low survival rates in the regions that were impacted. And then finally, we uh, discovered impaired reproduction and we'll get into more detail about that as well. So when we focus on the key health findings and these adverse health effects um, in dolphins, the, we really looked at findings in both the dead and the live animals. And where were we seeing consistency in the findings? And we had to go through a long process of ruling everything else out uh, to make sure that we weren't uh, tying findings to things that were not caused by the oil spill or oil exposure. And these included poor body condition, moderate to severe lung disease, adrenal system injury, which uh, exhibited as an impaired stress response and perinatal loss. These are well-documented in the peer-reviewed literature and I've made some resources available um, if you'd like to read more about these. Then at the conclusion of the damage assessment, we realized that even though we had documented all these different adverse health effects, there was still much to be learned as new questions were emerging. For example, dolphins living in with, uh, within the oil spill footprint were experiencing high sustained rates of reproductive failure. We were only documenting 20% of the pregnancies uh, to actually survive and result in a healthy offspring. That is compared to about 67% on average throughout the Southeast region. And then in addition, we were seeing uh, evidence of chronic pulmonary disease and emerging cardiac effects in dolphins, which had been previously documented in fish, birds, and humans. So I'm not going to go into all the different ways these findings were, were tied into human health in particular, but there, were a, there was a great deal of parallels found. We wrote a paper specifically on that in comparison across taxa, um, the different findings, but there were certainly similarities between the human health findings and the marine mammal findings. So now uh, we took that approach that I was uh, that I started with and talking about applying our Navy medicine to conservation medicine, and we really had to take it up a notch at this point. In order to better understand the reproductive and cardiac health effects, 
uh, in wild dolphins, we needed more advanced tools and techniques than we had on hand. So we had to then in response, carefully examine where was their overlap between the needs for our Navy medicine and the needs for investigating uh, these wild dolphin issues further. And as a result, we decided to really focus on enhancing our reproductive ultrasound techniques and our echocardiographic techniques. In 2016, we launched a multi-institutional research effort that was funded by Gomri and began working with Navy Dolphins to really refine these procedures so we could take them into the field. And so we just started to develop new fetal and placental ultrasound protocols that were completely modeled off the human reproductive ultrasound protocols. And then we ground truth them with the Navy's dolphins. We also went back in time and really examined with blood and ultrasound findings from Navy dolphins that had successfully given birth and then cared for their young and compared those to the findings from the occasional pregnancy that did not survive. And we actually went back 50 years to get as many as we could in the data set and really create a robust data set for this investigation. So these are just examples of a couple of papers that came out from that part of the study where we really wanted to um, use everything we had learned from the Navy Dolphins. And then um, in both the reproductive and the cardiac settings and the pulmonary settings, which um, I'm not speaking about today, but, but included a paper on that as well. Um, and then we took it to the field. So we, we, and we got as good as we could at, at it with dolphins and human care so that when we took it to the field, these techniques only took about 10 minutes each. So speed is extremely important when you're working with these wild animals. So we applied it to the wild animals. And as a result, we were able to rapidly evaluate the health of the developing fetus and the placenta in pregnant Baratari Bay dolphins during this, these very temporary catch and release health assessments. And we were able to also comprehensively evaluate their hearts by bringing two cardiologists with us into the field who helped us develop those protocols. At the conclusion of the study, we had diagnosed placental dysfunction in the majority of the wild dolphin pregnancies in Barataria Bay, and we detected cardiac anomalies in several of the adults. So how did all of these health and reproductive uh, effects actually impact the dolphin population as a whole? Dr. Lori Swacky, who was at the time our Director of Conservation Medicine and is now the Science Director at the U.S. Marine Mammal Commission, she and a team of epidemiologists and population biologists really set out to determine what was the long-term population trajectory, knowing everything that we did. And she built a model, um, which is in, in this paper, if you're a modeler and wanna read about how they did that. Um, but she basically determined that it would take about 30 to 35 years for the population to recover from these health effects. And that is primarily based on the fact that these animals really needed to die off and the offspring needed to take over. That is assuming that there were no, there are no additional pressures on the animals in the bay. So this is just talking about where they are today and how long it would take them as a population to recover. Again, that is if there were no additional pressures. There is a major restoration project that has been planned for Barataria Bay. So there, this uh, restoration project is called the Mid-Barataria Sediment Diversion Project. And although it is meant to help restore the region uh, and restore some of the damage caused by the oil spill, it involves diverting fresh water from the Mississippi into Barataria Bay. This would carry sediment into the bay and should result in building back about 40 square miles of land over a 50 year period. In the process, the salinity of the, salinity of the bay uh, will be intermittently and drastically reduced. It will hit zero parts per thousand. This uh, we believe will cause great harm to the dolphins that are living in Barataria Bay and will add an additional, additional pressure. We know that dolphins that are exposed to fresh water develop skin lesions, often infection. It uh, creates systemic and physiologic disturbance and eventual death. Again, the Navy animals were able to aid in our better understanding of how exactly would this uh, impact the animals. There were a lot of questions about 
how long would it take, uh, especially to help inform the management action, this restoration action, if you could actually control how long the bay was, uh, was flooded with fresh water, and if we could understand when, what are the critical time points for when do problems start to arise. So we looked at Navy dolphins that had actually spent time in different environments around the world and uh, had been cared for by, by veterinarians during that time and looked to see when did it look like things were starting to change. That was fed into a bigger study where a lot of data was pulled in to better understand the freshwater challenge that these animals will be faced with. And um, again, Dr. Swacky was a key in this investigation. And unfortunately, the population models that have been built to study this are now saying that uh, the proposed restoration activity will likely drive the Barataria Bay dolphins to extinction. It will take about 50 years, uh, but that is uh, the current trajectory. Mm -hmm. So following the publication of this model and the catastrophic de decline it predicts, the U.S. Marine Mammal Commission has declared Barataria Bay dolphins are now a species of concern. So with the primary threat being on this plan restoration activity. So I encourage you to read up more on this topic. It is a high priority topic in uh, marine mammal medicine, conservation and science. There are clear benefits of this restoration project to the community um, and to the land, uh, building the land back up, but there are also very clear consequences that are important to be aware of. So despite the gravity of the situation, there is some good news. And I did um, wanna just start to transition now into my final portion of the presentation and talk about some of the other good things that are coming out of um, all of this work that has happened over the last 12 years. Uh, during the most recent study where we were looking at multiple stressors on marine mammals and in the marine environment, we set out to develop minimally invasive ways to age the animals. And we collaborated with the Clock Foundation in Los Angeles to develop an epigenetic aging technique where you can take blood or skin from a, a bottlenose dolphin and determine exactly how old it is. So we created with the Navy dolphins who have known ages and known health status, we developed a clock that we can now use to um, uh, apply to other bottlenose dolphin populations and bring in samples and then determine how old is a specific dolphin. And then our next step is to determine what is that biological age of that animal. So we can get the chronological age uh, with great accuracy. And now our next step is, but how old is that animal really on the inside? And this is where the story really begins to expand because there are other bottlenose dolphins all over the world, not just here in the United States, not just in Barataria Bay. And there is one bottlenose dolphin in particular, the Lahiels bottlenose dolphin that lives only um, off the coast of South America. It is um, an at-risk species and there's only about 600 dolphins left. So we're collaborating with uh, experts in Brazil, and we are starting to build population age structures for them. And we're also hoping to understand through the biological epigenetic, uh, epigenetic analysis, how the pressures that they're under in Brazil could be influencing their decline um, off the coast of South America. The Lihil dolphin is just one of seven high priority species of small cetaceans as identified by IUCN's Integrated Conservation Planning for Cetaceans Group, or ICPC. And so this map shows the seven different species that they've identified um, are at our species of concern and their general location, although their distribution can be quite broad. And these species weren't necessarily chosen because they're the most critically endangered. They, although some of them are, um, but rather the consideration given to multiple factors, including politics, cultures, and species expert opinions. So these are species where we think if we work together in both an in situ and an ex situ way, we can bring all this knowledge we have learned from animals um, in human care and around the world, apply them to these species and actually make a difference in filling critical data gaps. 
So um, in response and to circle back to the topic of the presentation uh, today, our organization's really been looking for meaningful ways to apply our Navy medicine, our managed animal medicine to the conservation of wild at-risk porpoises, dolphins, and whales. And so we decided to stand up a new initiative called Operation Grace, the Global Rescue of At-Risk Cetaceans and Ecosystems, which aims to take our veterinary um, and our conservation expertise and apply it to as many at-risk species as possible, focusing on those seven that the IUCN's ICPC group has identified. So I'll just show you, and I'll wrap up here by showing you um, a two minute video. Please note that this video was created to engage the public, uh, general public audience, uh, but I hope that it will paint a picture for the board of what we're attempting to do and the approach that we're taking. So I'm gonna mute here because I believe the sound's gonna come through. So we'll see how it goes. Am I not mute? Imagine an ocean with no animals, a river with no life. Numerous species of dolphins, porpoises, and whales are at risk of extinction, but it's not too late to save them. The International Union for Conservation of Nature is calling for bold new ideas to help prevent the extinction of at-risk small cetaceans worldwide. This includes threatened and endangered dolphins and porpoises. From the Americas to Asia, Africa, and beyond, urgent action is needed. The National Marine Mammal Foundation is answering this call with Operation Grace, the global rescue of at-risk cetaceans and ecosystems. As a leader in marine mammal science, medicine, and conservation, our veterinarians and scientists are joining forces with local and global experts to help save these animals. Through a proven integrated approach to conservation called the One Plan Approach, we are combining knowledge, aligning international efforts, and building local capacity to support long-term solutions that benefit both animals and people. To maximize our impact, we are addressing critical conservation challenges with a 360-degree view of the animals, their ecosystems, and the human communities that rely on them. But we can't do this without your help. Support Operation Grace to ensure that the animals on the brink of extinction will be around for our children to cherish tomorrow. Together, we can empower communities around the world in the fight to save endangered species. Together, we can protect and preserve the delicate ecosystems that we all call home. Again, that's the um, the public version, but I hope it it helped really demonstrate the point that I was that I was trying to make. Um, and with the generous support of um, Dolphin Quest, we really were able to fully launch this program this year. We're now working in multiple countries with multiple species of concern from South America to Africa and Asia. And so one of the most pressing issues I'll just leave with you um, to contemplate is, is one that's unfolding today in the Amazon. Last month, uh, Dr. Forrest Gomez, who's pictured here in the Navy Blue Rash Guard, uh, our Operation Grace program director, spent time in Tefe, Brazil to bring her veterinary expertise to health assessments of these Amazon river dolphins at the request of the species ex expert, Dr. Miriam Marmontel. Weeks later, uh, dolphins began dying at unprecedented numbers uh, due to an extreme drought and high water temperatures that reached 102 degrees Fahrenheit. Over 175 Amazon river dolphins and 32 Takuchis have died so far. And this is about 10%, maybe up to 20% of the population of the river dolphins. So Dr. Marmontel and her team are working around the clock to better understand the cause, but they do believe it to be climate change and heat related. And Dr. Mont Gomez just arrived yesterday to help determine how to best save and protect the animals that are still trapped in the warm part of the Amazon River and will be moving. So in addition to the rescue effort, there are research questions and conservation questions that are being addressed as they necropsy the bodies of the animals that did not survive. 
So I tried to end on an inspiring, enlightening note, but then I just took it right back to reality. So um, I'll just end with some reflections for all of you uh, as you consider and during your transition from ILAR to Basker, is that how you're referring to it? Yes. Um, and as you're expanding your mission uh, into these different emerging areas of animal health conservation and science. And I specifically wanna address the third aim that you mentioned this morning that really resonated with me um, was that you're strengthening research, research that benefits human, animal, environmental, and planetary health. That is a bold, big aim. And I applaud you for that. So first I was thrilled to see marine mammals included on your agenda. Marine mammals and human care can help scientists and vets to develop these essential techniques and create relevant comparisons for studying and conserving wild animal populations in crisis all over the world. Wild marine mammals can also help us answer questions um, in animal health, science, conservation, and research, particularly given their role as top predators in rapidly evolving ecosystems under pressure. Conservation scientists should really consider the human dimension and how these animal crises are intimately connected to the humans that live side by side with them. Um, these, uh, the livelihoods and the uh, human health issues are often intertwined. And finally, marine mammal health science really must be prioritized for funding as opportunities for funding are extremely limited despite the unique relevance of marine mammals to ecosystem environmental and human health, and I might add planetary health as well. So that's it. I really do appreciate being here. Thank you so much for the time. And I'm not sure if we have time for questions, but I'm happy to take any um, now or at some other time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was extraordinary. And I, I am certain there are many questions, but I think what we're going to do just in the interest of time is so save your questions um, and we're going to circle back. So I think we'll go on to uh, our next speaker. So Tracy Goldstein is our next. Ah, she's online, of course. All right. So we are going to. Um, so. Oh, I thought you just said something. OK. <laughs> um, Dr. Goldstein is the director of the One Health Institute and professor in the Department of Microbiology, Immunology, and Pathology at Colorado State University. Prior to joining CSU, she was the division chief of the Emerging Threats Division Bureau for Global Health um, at USAID since 2020, where she led the Global Health Security Program, working with partner countries and the global community to build better preparedness for future emerging infectious disease threats. In her previous position, she was a professor in the Department of Pathology, Immunology, and Microbiology and Associate Director of the One Health Institute at the University of California, Davis. At UC Davis, she managed a research program um, to understand the health of people, wildlife, and the environment, as well as marine um, mammal virology diagnostic service and served as the co-principal investigator for the 10-year global PREDICT project. She is the chair of NOAA Fisheries Working Group on Marine Mammal Unusual Mortality Events, and she continues to study health and diseases in marine mammal and other wildlife populations um, in order to understand their health and the risk of spillover to people. And she'll speak to us today on One Health Surveillance to Detect and Understand Zoonotic Risk in Wildlife, Domestic Animals, and People. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's so great to be there. Well, unfortunately, not great to be there, not to be in person. I'm really sorry to not be here, um, but I'm really excited to be able to be talking to this group today. And I hope I uh, can follow on from the amazing speakers already. Um, I will touch on some some pieces that both Raina and Cynthia um, have raised and then hopefully expand on some of that. But really what I wanted to focus on today is, um, you know, One Health Surveillance in particular, bringing in wildlife um, into that surveillance system and how we can pair that uh, surveillance with um, follow-up work so that we can inform on risk both to animals and to people. Let's see if these are working today. No. Let's see if I can advance the slide. <clears throat> so as you are all aware, we're recovering currently from um, the worst pandemic in history. Um, 
I think the world is now very aware of how a pathogen from animals can change all parts of, of our lives, from our health to livelihoods to um, global economies. But really the question is, how did we get here? And how are we going to prevent being in this situation again? So I use this image that many of you may have seen before that is talking about sort of the unprecedented global change that is affecting all parts of the ecosystem, Things like land sea use change, uh, direct exploitation of species and environment, of course, climate change, pollution, pollution, and other invasive species. And all of this is really leading to increased um, outbreaks, um, both in severity and also in, in frequency, as well as changes in how humans and animals interact and, and how they are distributed. When we think about, in particular, emerging infectious diseases, um, many of us are aware that the majority of these are, are of animal origin, um, meaning zoonotic, and 75% of these emerging zoonoses actually originate in, in, um, in animals. Um, many of the pathogens that have already been spoken about today, from SARS to Nipah uh, to Ebola and, and HIV, all um, originated in animals. But really the key thing here are they are there are these low, large global changes that are affecting that but it's really human activities that are really changing that at the interface and um there's been a number of papers recently that have come out talking about the risks of animals you know in sort of all sorts of different environments but i think the key piece here is really to be thinking about how human behavior is really driving this change whether it's intensification of farming deforestation, land use change, um, increasing of uh, transportation, both at land and sea. These are all human behaviors. And in order to really address the risk of infectious diseases, we really need to be thinking about how do we understand or better understand um, human behavior, how contact is occurring, how we're changing our behaviors, and working with those sociologists to figure out how we can incorporate behavior change in order to be successful with mitigation. Many of you probably have seen a version of this before and Raina also um, sort of linked to this. Um, these viruses are often circulating in wild animals. They don't always make these animals ill. Sometimes they do, but they often don't. And then you may see spillover from wild animals directly into livestock. Um, we see this with avian influenza moving from wild birds into poultry. Um, and then they may amplify in, in poultry and then of course cause um, the large outbreaks that we're currently addressing almost globally right now. Um, but other times they may be able to spill directly over from wildlife um, into people. And this is an, an example of that, of course, is Ebola, um, sometimes Nipah virus, um, and as I said, HIV and others. And of course, SARS-CoV-2 is also one of those um, on the list. So when we're trying to think about how do we address these large global problems, we really need to be thinking about incorporating the One Health approach. And what does that mean? That means understanding the connection between the health of the environment, animals and people, and how those linked and needing to really bring together um, a multi-sectoral approach that addresses these issues at local, national, regional, and then global issues, um, global levels. Um, so incorporating not just um, people from one um, from one sector, but making sure that we're bringing in the veterinarians, the sociologists, the virologists, et cetera, to be able to address these large, really large problems that are affecting how um, we, the, how it's affecting our health. So as I go through, I'm going to talk about three different um, sort of stories um, showing how we can take surveillance in, from wildlife and then pair that with follow-up studies to see what that can help us to inform on and how they can inform either um, mitigation or, or future uh, monitoring. Um, one thing that I, you know, and as I go through, I'll talk about some challenges um, and opportunities um, related to this type of work. So first, as I mentioned, majority of these viruses are coming from wildlife, yet many of our surveillance systems are focused on either looking for specific pathogens in human or specific pathogens in livestock, often um, for economic purposes, but really there's no overlap or linking between these. So incorporating where we, where we can concurrent sampling of wildlife, livestock, and people to understand what pathogens are circulating in these different populations and what might be overlapping, as well as when we need a triangulation, in particular when there's outbreaks of disease, to try to understand what was present in animals 
either just just prior to that or earlier, and then what might be circulating in people. Often trying to do these One Health um, studies are um, can be more complicated. Obviously, it requires more um, coordination among sectors, bringing in the biologists, the veterinarians, the medical um, personnel. But really what this allows is for sharing across sectors, whether it's um, at the public and veterinary health lab level, all the way up to the, the government levels, which is really um, clearly needed in order to be able to address these problems as we see pathogens moving from one sort of sector um, across into another. And then critical to all of this is really trying to understand those behavioral and cultural practices that are promoting an increasing risk. As I said, it's human behavior that's changing and bringing people and animals in contact in more places and in more and risky ways. And we're often seeing um, this high risk occurring at these buffers where um, there's that large change such as deforestation, bringing wild populations in closer contact with domestic and or human populations that's really driving that risk. And so when we're thinking about a One Health um, approach, we really need to be figuring out how can we um, key into that, that social um, side of, of things, bring in the social scientists and those professionals to be able to help us to first appropriately identify the cultural practices that are occurring, and then to find ways culturally to be able to address these to reduce contact with animals um, in a safe way and reduce risk. So often when you're trying to identify um, pathogens across different species and across different sample sites, we need to really think about how do we cast a wide net. So starting with detection, often um, methods such as uh, broad family PCR are used. So for example, you can use um, a coronavirus assay that might be able to detect SARS-CoV-2, but also other coronaviruses, and then also metagenomics. But this is certainly an area where there are a number of challenges, and, and I feel that um, much more innovation is needed for us to figure out how do we expand our toolkit in order to be able to better detect um, both known and new threats. Um, just doing the surveillance and detecting um, these potential pathogens is not enough. We need to then take it to the next step to be able to sequence the genome so we can better understand and classify what these potential risks may be, and then really link that with other um, processes, whether it's epidemiologic studies, ecologic studies, or exper experimental work in order to better understand and um, assess the risk. So this is a slightly different way um, of um, showing the information that Raina was sort of referring to, where you sort of look at um, this issue at different scales. So often you can screen for viruses um, on a global scale that might tell us a little bit about ecological or evolutionary drivers. Um, and then we need to drop down at different scales, looking at individual viruses or hosts to try to understand the potential risk and then put that all together so that we can start to um, obtain a picture of um, what might be needed. And again, I want to highlight um, another challenge right now, and this is often the case um, after a large pandemic such as we went through, where while we're talking about implementing a, a One Health approach, and this is really being spoken at it at such high levels, all the way from the WHO through the Biden-Harris administration and reflected in a number of documents, it's important for us as, as, as the scientific community to show how we would implement this work, the benefits of that work, and then also to make sure that, we're, that resource are going towards that sort of pre-emergent phase. We have um, a tendency to invest more on public health, um, which is important, but if we don't assess what's happening prior to spillover, we will never really be able to truly mitigate what occurs once um, spillover occurs and to be able to uh, prevent that spread. So I'm going to um, jump into um, the three uh, different examples that I was going to show you to sort of walk you through how we've done some of this work. Um, obviously, coronaviruses don't need much of an introduction any longer. I think we're all, um, you know, quite familiar with these, sadly, after the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. But some of the information that people don't necessarily recognize is prior to um, recognizing SARS-1, 2, and then MERS, coronaviruses have been circulating in people for many, many years, and most of them have caused mild um, diseases, usually linked to um, respiratory illness and, and sort of it gets caught in with that sort of 
sort of seasonal sort of flu cold type complex. And we often aren't doing um, surveillance to really understand what is circulating when. Um, but really what's, what most people don't really recognize is that the majority of these viruses actually have their origins in, in animals and many of them um, in particular in bats. And so this really made us want to think about, you know, what is it about bats and this association with um, coronaviruses? Um, there have been a number of um, non-human coronaviruses that have been severe pathogens um, in, in animals, including porcine epidemic diarrhea virus, and then of course, FIP in cats. So there's a lot of gaps in understanding of coronaviruses, but clearly this is um, a, a, a family of zoonotic concern. We've seen that they can be quite efficient in many different species and understanding more about them um, is definitely critical. So as a part of the work that we were doing, uh, funded by USAID, we wanted to understand what was the distribution and the diversity of coronaviruses among different species. And we were able to do this work um, over 30 countries and focusing um, particularly on bats, non-human primates, rodents, shrews, um, there were some other wildlife, and then humans and when possible, domestic animals. And what you can see very clearly is despite um, the number of animals that um, were tested, um, the, by far the largest majority of coronaviruses um, were in bats. And in fact, um, we by the end of the, the study, we'd actually detected almost 200 uh, distinct different coronaviruses in bat species. So by far, um, why uh, large more numbers in, in that species. Additionally, um, we found that these uh, viruses were across the entire coronavirus family, even in groups that we had previously thought were linked with um, birds or, um, other, or rodents. And so this sort of indicated that perhaps bats really are the reservoir host across the board uh, for coronaviruses. Now, if we were talking about hunter viruses, um, in this uh, scenario, we would be talking about rodents and shrews. And so it's important to recognize that different taxa seem to be more likely to be host reservoirs for different types of viral families. The next thing we wanted to do was try to take a look at where were the bat species that we tested um, around the world in terms of distribution? And then where did we find um, the, these viruses? And this would be important to inform on where to put um, future efforts for surveillance. So again, you can, so what you're looking at here is species richness. So when you see red, it means that we were finding um, more bat species or we sampled more bat species. And where you see green, either fewer species or information is not well known in that area. Um, so certainly what we found were there were hotspots of areas around the world where there was a high diversity of bats. And interestingly, in those places, we also found a very high diversity of viruses. So the more bats, the more types of coronaviruses um, were found. Um, in terms of the epidemiologic um, side of things, many of these positives were found in feces. So that's important when you're thinking about um, what type of samples you might want to test in order to um, broadly detect viruses. And then we also found found, as Raina pointed out, um, a high prevalence in younger animals. So that is also important to think about how we would target our work. Um, Raina sort of um, uh, mentioned this as well. Um, first, a couple of things that came out of the study. We, we know that these coronaviruses or the ability to detect them is quite rare. So we found that if we were not able to sample more than 200 animals, we generally didn't uh, detect coronaviruses. So again, important to think about in terms of resources. But within a species, we found anywhere between one and seven different coronaviruses. So again, um, species differed in terms of the number and the types of coronaviruses that we found. But if we really extrapolate this out into the number of species that, are, that we know um, occur um, globally, this lets us know that there are about more than 3,000 coronaviruses still to be um, discovered in bats. And so really to think about if we want to understand risk um, from the past, we really need to be thinking about how do we invest in um, surveillance in the future to be able to protect both animal con conserved species as well as human health. 
So building on that a little bit, we also found that there was an association of certain viruses with certain hosts. So I'm going to focus on um, the SARS-CoV-2 or the Sobeka virus group, um, because of course that's of a lot of interest. But what we found was the SARS-related um, beta coronaviruses were generally found in insectivorous bats. So these are rhinolophid and hippocytorid family bats. And so this is really important to think about where we want to um, focus our, our future efforts if we really want to understand what is the distribution of um, SARS-related coronaviruses in bats and where might we look for them. So similar to the previous slide, we took a similar approach where we took the hippocytorid and rhinolophid bats um, globally and um, mapped them out by distribution to see where there was overlap of um, where these uh, bat species were. And also overlapped that with where we found the, the SARS um, 2B coronaviruses. So the first you, thing you can see is there's a hotspot in Southeast Asia um, where we found both a high diversity of these bat species as well as a large number of positive bats for these coronaviruses. Um, but then also, if you take a look in Africa, you see pockets in West Africa, Central Africa, and, and also Southern Africa. And in fact, we did find coronaviruses, um, to be coronaviruses in bats in Rwanda, Uganda, and also in Tanzania. So I wanted to highlight a couple of things with this. First, it's important to recognize that we don't want to only look at where viruses have come from in the past. Of course, we see that huge red hot spot in Southeast Asia, and we know that to be the case as we've seen SARS-1 and 2 emerge um, from that region of the world previously. But the fact that we see hot spots in places like Africa makes us really think about how do we um, look at risk in the future and how do we prepare governments and countries to be able to detect these risks before they're able to spill over. The other piece that I'll talk about um, bef um, before I move on to the next slide is, interestingly, many of the viruses that we found in places like Africa did not appear to, based on the genome sequence, use that human receptor that, um, that we all know now to be so important that allows these viruses to enter human cells. Whereas many of the sequences that we found in Southeast Asia did appear to have that ability to use the ACE2 receptor. So another really important piece of wildlife surveillance is to understand the um, diversity of these viruses and, and, and start to be able to dig into what is it that allows one thing to be able to use a human receptor and another not, and, and what, uh, what are those underlying mechanisms, because that potentially can help us to understand how a non-pathogen could potentially evolve to become a pathogen. Finally, um, that that work around um, sort of pinpointing where SARS-related coronaviruses may be found actually panned out um, sort of at the early parts of the pandemic, where um, many um, collaborators began to start to look in these um, areas of the world that appear to be um, high risk for, for detection of those. And there have been a number of studies um, since that time that have published viruses in Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, um, Myanmar, and other places. So really highlighting the fact there's a lot more for us to learn and surveillance to be done in order to understand what is circulating um, in these animals. I'm going to shift gears um, to another family of viruses and this time talk a little bit about how we might want to um, link surveillance with some experimental studies to understand risk. Um, it's been interesting listening to a lot of the conversation around um, the pandemic and, and why is it that we don't know the origin um, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and this is actually not unusual, unfortunately. Um, we often don't have surveillance systems in place that are, that are monitoring for these pathogens all along. And so recreating history after the fact is often quite difficult. And Ebola virus research is one of those key examples. So despite more than 40 years of research, we still don't actually know the reservoir for many of these Ebola viruses. Um, we st we're starting to understand that past viruses are often linked with contact with primates and sometimes in bats, but we really don't have a lot of information. There is some evidence um, both by PCR and also uh, by antibodies showing that bats likely maintain these viruses, but it's been difficult um, to really understand that. 
And so at the um, end of the West Africa outbreak, the largest, um, at the time, the largest, largest Ebola virus outbreak, um, USAID had asked if we could try to figure out, if we could understand what were the hosts um, of Ebola viruses and how were they circulating in animals. And so we did a large study um, looking at more than um, 20,000 animals across um, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia, we looked at these animals across um, a, a geographic distribution from urban, rural to forest areas. And then we wanted to look at potential reservoirs, so bats, rodents, and primates, as well as potential spillover hosts. Um, there's, we didn't understand if there was the potential for this virus to be spilling back into domestic species and then being maintained. And then we also wanted to look at multiple samplings over time, um, both in the dry and in the wet season. So surprisingly, we actually found um, positive insectivorous bats in um, three different communities within Sierra Leone. When we did the sequencing, we found that this was an, indeed an Ebola virus, but it was not Ebola Zaire. It was a new Ebola virus that at the time we named Bombolee. And this was found in two species of insectivorous bats. Um, and these bats were widespread across um, Sub-Saharan um, and Central Africa. And they were found in people's homes. So it was critical for us to understand if this virus had the potential to infect people. So this is where um, we, we pulled in a number of different experimental studies uh, using synthetic systems to be able to compare Bombolee Ebola virus to Ebola Zaire and other Ebola viruses. The question was, where did it sit on the spectrum? We know that Sudan and Ebola um, Zaire are, are highly pathogenic, whereas Reston appears to be pathogenic in primates, but less pathogenic in people. So we um, use different synthetic systems to understand pieces of different genes to see if the virus could use the human receptor to enter cells, it was able to. If it was um, had the ability to replicate in human cells and culture, again, it was able to, but not as um, e efficiently as e Ebola Zaire was in human cells. And, this, and then also to evaluate the ability to limit the immune system um, to be able to prevent infection. And, and this is something that Ebola Zaire is really good at. And again, Bombali had all of these features, but not um, at that um, same level as Zaire. So this was critically important for us to be able to take this information, be able to use that in terms of working with the community, working with the, with the government and being able to communicate um, what we found, as well as to prepare governments to be able to work with their um, laboratories and, uh, and surveillance systems to be able to expand um, um, different um, Ebola viruses in their repertoire. Additionally, because we found um, that these, these species were widespread, this sparked an additional studies across Africa and in fact found this virus in bats, for example, in, in Kenya. So again, letting us know that these viruses are more widely distributed than we thought previously, and that we really need to be thinking about risk in terms of where do animals live and where are they distributed rather than just um, thinking about it from the past. Finally, as a part of this work, we also, in um, coordination with um, the US CDC, detected Marburg virus in bats in Sierra Leone. Um, this was the first time that we actually found a, a, um, a hemorrhagic virus in a bat prior to an outbreak in, in the region. Um, this was the furthest west that Marburg virus had ever been found. And if you take a look at the, the map on the right, it shouldn't be surprising. In orange shows the distribution of this bat species. And we see that while it is found in pockets uh, along the west coast of, of Africa and central and then southern Africa, it also is found in this pocket um, in, in West Africa. Um, Rosetta aegypticus is known to be the host of Marburg virus. And so this was critically important to make sure that we could work with labs to have the ability to test for the virus, as well as clinical doctors to recognize that when they see hemorrhagic disease, to be thinking more broadly than um, Ebola Zaire or Lassa fever in those, in those regions. And that actually really paid off. Um, fast forward to 2021, 22, and 23, we've seen Marburg outbreaks now in Ghana, Guinea, uh, Equatorial Guinea and also in Tanzania. And fortunately, because of some previous work, um, systems were in place to be able to test quickly and respond quickly in those outbreaks and limiting, um, limiting, limiting them. 
And then the final example that I'm going to use is kind of bringing it back to climate change and, and back here to the U.S. Um, I mentioned I've been doing some work with marine mammals and lived up in Alaska. Um, I think climate change is something that we're seeing affecting the world globally. But when you live um, in up in Alaska, it's sort of prescient every day. And, and it's very clear how um, the effects of what's happening in the environment is affecting the marine mammal species, which is also, of course, affecting um, human livelihoods. So we've seen some of the warmest temperatures ever um, in um, the last few years up in the Arctic. And in the winter, often we're finding years where the ice is no longer forming um, across um, but in, in that ice bridge between um, Alaska and Russia. And this is um, really important for some of the work I'm about to show you. And we're also seeing entire villages having to be relocated um, as they're falling into the sea uh, due to uh, loss of sea ice. So as a result, and a part of this, NOAA um, began um, to do some work. So this is the Polar Ecosystems Program to understand how um, Arctic species, Arctic seals in particular, were ad adapting to low ice. And so they were capturing animals, putting satellite tags on them and trying to understand how they were using the habitat. As a part of this work, we were, were sampling for a number of different um pathogens, bacterial and viral pathogens known to cause um, disease and outbreaks in marine mammals. And very surprisingly, we found a virus called a uh, Fosine distemper virus that causes outbreaks in harvest seals um, in um, Europe. We went back in time and were able to pinpoint when um, the uh, virus was um, first detected, um, but using archive samples um, in, in a number of different species in the area. And we're able to then link that with animal movement, looking at where animals were moving and looking at um, sea ice, so openings in sea ice over the years. So what we found was um, when there was um, the first um, outbreak, large outbreak in 2002 in Europe, that was the first year that um, openings in ice along the uh, um, Alaskan and Canadian coast um, were open. And this allowed animals to move from the um, Atlantic into the Pacific, bringing um, the virus with them. Also, so, if you um, begin to wrap it up. Yep. And so this is my last slide. So really, I just wanted to talk. I, so I just wanted to end by saying um, there's a, sort of a number of areas here where public health and science sort of intersect. Um, and, and and I think this is an area that will be pretty important for, for us to think about how do we partner on this. This information that we're finding is, is important to get out to, into the communities and work with the host country governments. Um, and this puts us at this weird intersection in terms of how do we um, share those that information without jeopardizing also engaging with the scientific community. And so that's just the last challenge I wanted to put out there. Thank you. I apologize. I went a little long, um, but thank you very much and, and appreciate the time. Thank you. There was It was wonderful. And we'll have a chance for some questions at the end. All right, let's move. Uh, oh, there we go. There's Steve. It's in person. All right. So um, we are next going to hear uh, from Dr. Steve Asofsky, and he's going to be speaking. Uh, his title of his talk is Beyond Fences, Policy Options for Wildlife, Livelihoods, and Transboundary Animal Disease Management in Southern Africa. Uh, Steven Asofsky is a veterinarian um, who works on developing and helping to apply science-based landscape scale approaches to conservation, particularly in terms of policy guidance to address challenges at the interface of wildlife, agriculture, and other types of land use and people. Uh, he is the J. Hyman Professor of Wildlife Health and Health Policy at Cornell University's College of Veterinary Medicine, and he's one of the pioneers um, of the One Health Movement. He's been involved in many of the big um, initiatives related to One Health. Uh, they are in the package, so I'm just going to um, say them, the Manhattan Principles of One World, One Health, um, AHEAD, uh, and a number of others. So I'm going to leave those and just... Um, share the rest of this. Uh, he has brought his uh, practical expertise, which includes um, both health and environmental conservation perspectives, um, to begin to shape an uh, interdisciplinary uh, approach to the uh, the field of planetary health. And um, Professor Osofsky previously held senior positions at the World Wildlife Fund and at the, w at the Wildlife Conservation Society, WCS, as well as the government, um, at, as with the government of Botswana. Uh, he was also uh, honored to serve as the 
as an American Association for the Advancement of Science and Diplomacy Fellow, and as a Biodiversity Program Specialist uh, at the US Agency for International Development. And he is now shepherding uh, Cornell University's new Cornell Wildlife Health Center. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to share some work with you here today. Um, again, my talk is called Beyond Fences, Policy Options for Wildlife, Livelihoods, and Transboundary Animal Disease Management in Southern Africa, all work carried out under the AHEAD program, which stands for Animal and Human Health for the Environment Development, which is under our Cornell Wildlife Health Center umbrella. So this is a, a zebra, dead along a foot and mouth disease control fence in Botswana. And this was something I would intermittently see when I first got to Botswana in the early 1990s to serve as the government's first wildlife veterinary officer for the Botswana Department of Wildlife and National Parks. But the story I need to share with you here today goes back to the late 1950s, when all the countries we're gonna talk about were colonies or protectorates. So Botswana was the British protectorate of Bekawanaland. Zimbabwe was British Southern Rhodesia, Namibia was German Southwest Africa, and then under South African auspices. And in the late 1950s, if the colonial powers were obviously looking for economic traction. This is before diamonds were discovered in this part of the world. And if you're a colonialist, that's what you do. And what they decided they would try was to export beef from Southern Africa back to Europe, back to the motherland. But even in the late 1950s, they were aware that the foot and mouth disease family of viruses were resident in the region, in the African buffalo. The African buffalo is the only wild species we know of that is a natural reservoir of these viruses. They don't get sick from them, but they do carry them. So what largely the British and the Germans decided to do in order to export this beef was to start to build fences to keep buffalo and other wildlife over here and livestock over here. And over the ensuing decades, thousands and thousands of kilometers of these fences have been built. Many of them funded externally, not just by the British and the Germans, but by the EU more broadly, the World Bank. And I think it's safe to say in retrospect, what we have can be described as a slow motion environmental train wreck, because hundreds of thousands, if not millions of wild animals like the zebra have died along these fences because these animals need to migrate. I want you to keep this in mind. Migration is the lifeblood of the conservation of these species. They need to migrate to access grazing at different times of year, fresh water, mineral resources, breeding opportunities to maintain long-term genetic viability. So again, this was, a, this was a monosectoral decision focused on beef agriculture. Wildlife was not considered a particularly valuable resource. So I just wanna give you a sense of what these fences look like. The line map is just the major fences in this part of the world. And imagine if you're a wildebeest, you're not gonna be able to go across this region. The animals don't care about national boundaries. They historically had these long migratory routes. The color image is an aerial photo. You can see the maintenance roads along a double cordon fence that goes on and on and on into the horizon. This is a, a well-maintained double cordon fence. They're usually 10 to 12 feet high. And if they are well-maintained, they do what they were intended to do, which is to stop the movements of animals. So when I talk to our students, I kind of explain that history as sort of the environmental factors, but I wanna spend the rest of our time together really talking about good news. And today, today nature-based tourism, nature-based related activities contribute more to the GDP, to the gross domestic product of the Southern African development community, the Southern Africa region, than livestock agriculture, forestry, and fisheries combined. That's a dramatic change in the macroeconomic picture and one that has not been lost upon the heads of states of these countries. So there's been a, an experiment underway for now about 20 years where more than a dozen peace parks or trans-frontier conservation areas on this slide, you'll hear me say TFCA, trans-frontier conservation areas are being created. And I wanna define those for you. A peace park or a TFCA, trans-frontier conservation areas when two or more countries essentially agree to rezone, if you will, so that say wildlife in a national park in country A can get back and forth to a game reserve in country B. It's, it's a rezoning to facilitate restoration of these critical wildlife movements. And as I said, there are more than a dozen of these now. And if you add up all those blotches on that I put on the map there, 
if the surface area adds up to the same as if you had the state of Texas, the state of California, and the state of New York combined. This is, I believe, the largest experiment in terrestrial conservation in the world. And very few people are even aware that it's underway. And I want to be clear, the motivated here is, is largely economic, and that's fine. If you think about global beef flows, Africa contributes probably less than 1% of all international trade of beef, but Africa owns nature-based tourism in many ways. It's their global competitive advantage. And so in many ways, the Peace Parks movement is about making wildlife two things, economically rational and socioculturally acceptable. If we can do those two things, then conservation becomes an ongoing land use uh, uh, of preference. So I want to now quickly zone in on the Kavango Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation. It's that amoeba looking thing down there. It is um, superimposed there. You can see on the Northeastern United States, it is the biggest transfrontier conservation area terrestrial in the world. Um, and if you think about what it really is, it is not a giant national park. None of these transfrontier conservation areas are parks per se. They're multi-use areas. There's agriculture. There are people, there are railroads, there's mining. But at the core is this attempt to restore habitat so that wildlife can migrate, even though there are other, other obstacles. So I want to tell you a little bit more about the Kavangos and these because it is the focus of our work right now. It was created in 2011 at a, a heads of state treaty level. Angola, Botswana, Namibia, Zambia, and Zimbabwe came together, came together to create this entity. It's more than 500,000 square kilometers. It's home to about two and a half million people, which is fairly sparsely populated, which works in its favor and their livestock. One of the really important things about Taza, I will call it Taza for short, it is home to the majority of what's left of Africa's elephants. Decades and decades ago, we had millions of elephants in Africa. We're down, unfortunately, to less than 500,000 in all likelihood, 228,000 of them. The survey just came out a few months ago. Those that bulk of those elephants are in these five countries. There are significant pressures on this landscape related to human settlement and poaching, drought and fire, but veterinary fences are at the core of the land use conundrum. And I want, I want to sort of pause for a moment and just recognize that we as a species are very good at seeing snapshots, but we're not very good at seeing movies. What I mean by that is if you go on safari today to Botswana or Namibia, it's spectacular. You will see spectacular wildlife. But if you saw those same landscapes in the 1950s, there were far, far more many wildlife uh, uh, across, across this habitat. All the major wildlife species have declined because of these threats, including fragmentation of habitat, the building of fences. The other thing I should mention, we've heard a lot about climate change today. If you think about the climate models and what they say about Southern Africa, it all points to an ongoing drying trend. And the only way for wildlife, or in fact, pastoralists and their cattle to be able to adapt to climate change is to be able to move north-south, adapt them. But the fences even preclude the only major adaptive strategy available to both wildlife and people. And the premise of the work we're doing is that the way we've chosen to manage diseases by foot and mouth with geographic barriers threatens the entire vision for a successful transfrontier conservation area. I also want to be clear that cattle are part and parcel of the cultures of these countries. Botswana has had cattle since 600 AD. This isn't about pitting one sector against another. It's not either or. It's about finding a resilient combination. We learned very harshly during COVID when tourism completely dried up. It was a good thing people still had their livestock. Similarly, when we have droughts, livestock often get hit hard first, but tourism can go on for quite a while, even in the face of drought. So we want resilience. We want to find a way to harmonize these sectors. So I just want to recap some of the things that I've explained. Transfrontier conservation, this whole movement requires a free movement of wildlife over these large geographic areas. And yet the historically accepted approaches to the management of transboundary animal diseases requires the prevention of movement of animals. So the vision for peace parks and a geographic or fence-based management of animal diseases are fundamentally incompatible. And sustainable livelihoods depend on a new approach. If you look at what's happened with foot and mouth disease in the region, I've got three countries here, Botswana, Namibia, and South Africa. 
And each of the three bars are a decade of the incidence of foot and mouth disease outbreaks. And you can see up until the, uh, the, the 80s and 90s, we, we had a lot of foot and mouth and then vaccines were introduced locally. And we had a precipitous drop in the incidence of foot and mouth disease outbreaks. That was great. It was great for livestock agriculture, but you can see it didn't take too long for the outbreaks to be rebounding. And that's happened for a few reasons. First of all, all of that fencing infrastructure that I mentioned to you, it's really expensive to maintain in a place where elephants constantly break it. And a lot of those external subsidies that I mentioned have melted away. We also have the same problems managing foot and mouth that we've seen with, with coronavirus, with COVID, where vaccines have to keep up with the circulating strains. And that's a challenge. And sometimes there might be mismatches between the vaccine strain for livestock and what's circulating. And even getting enough vaccines into enough cattle to make an epidemiological difference becomes a challenge as more and more governments are strapped in terms of their veterinary services. So we've had more than more than 30 outbreaks uh, in this decade that I, I need to update that number. And what we really have now is a crisis. You can see foot and mouth outbreaks are constant in the region. But for what we're trying to do, this crisis does represent an opportunity. So this is that same amoeba I was showing you before. You can see the green outline is the outline of the of the Casa Transfrontier Conservation Area. What I want you to notice here, does my pointer show up on there? Yeah, it does. All the, these six circles with lines in them, those are the six most important corridors for wildlife to be able to migrate. This has been found through radio telemetry work, long-term wildlife uh, observations, historical records. We know where the wildlife need to be able to move. And all six of those are either currently compromised or will likely be compromised by things like veterinary fencing. So I wanna, we're gonna zoom in here. This is the, uh, the Okavango here, and we're gonna zoom in. And in this map, we've zoomed in. Here is the Okavango River. Here's the Okavango Delta, many of you have heard of it. In this map, sorry, the fences are yellow and black. There's foot and mouth disease fences. There's also fences for what's called bovine lung disease. And I want you to focus on this pocket here. I think by nobody's design, the fencing system created a giant pocket and elephants live in this pocket. There are about 18,000 elephants and about 15,000 people. And along the river, there are a lot of human habitations where the elephants don't really wanna get into trouble. So what we've got is a giant cage. And this elephant population is growing at at least 5% a year. This is the hotbed of human elephant conflict in Kaza. Elephants raid crops, people get killed. This is, this is a, a pressure cooker. And it was created inadvertently by a fencing policy that didn't take the ecosystem into account. So now we've got to figure out what to do about this. I want to put a finer point on it. This is some fascinating data from Robin Naidu and team uh, from Frontiers in Conservation Science. This is based on years and years of radio telemetry. The top map, you can see this black area, that's that same pocket. Those are dots representing satellite collar readings from female elephants that were collared in Botswana. And over the years, you can see they never left that box. The red in that map are female elephants collared in Namibia. And they're also bunched up along the other fences that I showed you. The female elephants are not able to get through these barriers. I'm going to tell you why. But interestingly, this map down the bottom is a little bit different. Male elephants. The male elephants collared in both countries, it's a little bit more of a diffuse picture because the bull elephants don't stay with the herds. They will break through fences and move around a bit more. But the herds, the females don't move because even when the fences are badly damaged, there's a cable just about this high, just at calf, elephant calf height. And if the elephant calves can't cross it, the herds won't cross it. So those elephants are boxed in. This is a fairly decrepit fence. And that's, I'm holding the cable just to show you that the, this, this one piece of infrastructure has this huge impact. This is data shared by the government of Botswana, the government of Namibia, the NGO EcoExist, and the World Wildlife Fund. And this is real, uh, again, radio telemetry data. And I want you to focus in that same box, those gray elephants, those are females bouncing around like ping pong balls, hitting that fence. The red on the Namibian side, same thing. Female elephants largely bouncing along another fence. They just can't get through. And it's not just elephants. Elephants are a very visual species for us to use, but we've documented a whole range of species with this same problem. 
So I, I, I'm trying to make it clear that in this part of the world, livestock agriculture and wildlife conservation are both absolutely vital for, for economic development, for resilience, for equity. And I mentioned that people need their livestock, but that nature-based tourism is crucial to economic growth. And what we've seen over the years is that the current attempts to control foot and mouth geographically, meaning with fences, is now limiting livelihood opportunities and it's compromising the whole system. And we have this intensifying conflict between these two sectors. The livestock sector blames wildlife for the presence of this foot and mouth disease virus, and, and the wildlife sector blames livestock for the fences. So we need some solutions. And that's what we've been working on for a number of years. And whatever we come up with has to do fundamentally three things. It has to help Southern Africa's pastoralists and farmers. The solution can no longer threaten the future of free ranging wildlife. And we've got to be able to provide confidence to any countries that do want to buy beef from this part of the world, that they're going to be able to import a product that's safe. Remember the, the whole European model here, they didn't want to accidentally have foot and mouth get into their cattle and then import it to Europe because that's a disaster for the, your livestock. It also shuts down your international trade overnight. So the, the whole world is afraid of these virus. So we've got to make sure whatever we do is safe. So if we can add an extra hour, I have a whole lecture on the solution that I'm going to summarize in one slide. The solution is remarkably simple. There was existing science to show that if you want to make a high quality steak, you know, your cattle are going to be vaccinated. You're going to quarantine them. But when you slaughter them, if you hang the beef above two degrees Celsius for 24 hours, so the pH drops below six, then you debone it and you take out the lymph nodes, that beef is going to be safe in terms of FMD. FMD, if that cow had the virus in its system, that virus would not be present in the end product. That value chain based approach, we didn't invent it, but what we did is work with our colleagues in SADC and the African Union to convince the World Organization for Animal Health, OIE, now WOA, that this bio, bio safety based approach, this value chain based approach, should be considered equivalent to fences. It took about 10 years using science-based advocacy to convince OIE to change the rules. But in 2015, all the world's chief veterinary officers voted on changing what's called the Terrestrial Animal Health Code. These rules are what the World Trade Organization relies on for countries, and all the world's countries are members of the OIE. It's older than the UN. These rules are what allow for the safe trade of animals and animal products around the world. So in 2015, this approach where we looked at how beef was produced was accepted globally. And that was, that was a huge transformation in thinking. And that meant that the poorest farmers living in Northern Botswana closest to Buffalo for the first time in 70 years, that's multiple generations, could access international markets for their beef. So the, the science is there, the policy has been changed, and now we're working to implement this in partnership with the countries that wanna pursue it. And one of the things we did with these, with the yeah. SADC, we wrote the guidance how to do this. It's a very simple, this is not a, a complicated exercise, but how to process that beef from farm to fork to make it safe. It's fairly low tech, but it's very well documented. And SADC has now made this an official document. SADC, the Southern African Development Community is essentially, it's like the EU of Europe. It's the official body that governs the countries on these things from Tanzania all the way to South Africa as a multilateral organization. They've now adopted these guidelines for what we've called commodity-based trade of beef because we're focusing, focusing on the commodity, not whether the cow happened to be living near a species like an African buffalo. Now that those guidelines have been accepted, we're working with individual countries. Here's an example from Botswana where they asked us to do what's called a gap analysis. They said, look, let's look at our value chain again, from farm, farm to fork, what are we doing well? What can we do better? Looking at everything from vaccines to quarantine, to slaughter facilities, to how the animals are herded to keep them away from wildlife, all the risk mitigation that's needed. And the government of Botswana has now been using this gap analysis, again, to implement this process so that the poorest of poor farmers for the first time in generations can trade their beef. This enabling environment that this partnership has created gave the partner countries the confidence to work with us on what was really a thorny question. Remember I told you we knew where the wildlife migrations were most damaged by fences? Well, this was an analysis we did during the pandemic that really put a fine point on this. We went fence by fence, we did aerial surveys and ground surveys and looked at tracks, spore surveys, 
historical data, radial telemetry, and we showed exactly which fences are damaging which species most significantly. When I first started in Botswana in the early 1990s, that was not a question you were even allowed to ask. But because we've been working to solve these problems, there's now a willingness to revisit a paradigm that needs some rethinking. So I wanna share with you the, the very basic results here. This is that same amoeba map, but in, I've inserted Botswana's map with the fences shown. The red fences in this map are fences that are gonna stay pretty much regardless. They're important. They need to be there for managing the beef sector to allow the ongoing exports of beef. But the two different shades of blue are the fences that we found are most damaging to wildlife movements. The dark blue fences on one side or the other there's significant livestock populations. So some more work would need to be done to even talk about whether they could be removed. But the light blue fences, the aquamarine fences, pretty much cover almost all of those six key pinch points that I described to you. And these are the light blue areas that are most damaging to wildlife. And with the advent of new approaches to herd management and commodity-based trade of beef, this way to be able to sell your beef without requiring fences, that's the key. The OIE says you don't need fences if you do this right. The governments that we're working with in Kaza have now given us the green light to answer the question, what if some of these fences were no longer there? Some of these fences were put up decades ago. The epidemiological situation in may ca many cases may have changed, and we have this new tool, this commodity-based trade of beef. So we are now finishing up an analysis, basically asking a scenarios-based question. If this 50 kilometers of a fence wasn't here. Would it, would it cause more risk to your livestock or not? If not, would you consider realigning it to restore the migrations that are the lifeblood of the biodiversity of the region? So I was just last month uh, at, at the, uh, around the UN General Assembly meetings talking about this with President Masisi of Botswana and Minister of Environment Kareng. This is a really important discussion. And Botswana is a small country. We've been working directly with their version of USDA veterinary services, with their departments of veterinary services in Botswana and Namibia. But I also wanted to make sure that we had support at the highest levels of government. And frankly, the issue of that human elephant conflict, that pressure cooker that I mentioned to you was very much on the president's mind. So I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that we're going to be able to continue to navigate this to find a win-win solution. I'm off to the region again in two weeks where we're presenting the epidemiological analysis that I've described to you, where we're gonna go fence by fence and offer up using data that the governments have, have provided. Say, look, this fence, you're right, it needs to stay because if you take it down, you're gonna get more foot and mouth and more lung disease and livestock. But this fence, if you take it down, we don't believe it's gonna pose any increased risk for animal diseases. That's what we're gonna be doing in November. All this work was done under the auspices, again, of our AHEAD program, Animal and Human Health for the Environment and Development. We're basically a facilitator. My role is to be a biodiplomat and to bring these sectors together using good science, but to recognize that we can find harmonious ways to solve these sectoral challenges. I've got 20 years of data and reports at cornell-ahead.org, and our broader program is, is, is well summarized at wildlife.cornell.edu. And I think that's all I have. Thank you. It's super fascinating. I know there are many questions, but I think we're going to move on to our final speaker and then we'll have a, a, a little stretch and then we can dive in with our, our discussion. So um, our final speaker, there we go. Okay, is uh, Rowena Purcell Watson. Uh, who is with the U.S. Department of State, serving as the Division Chief for Wildlife Conservation and Combating Wildlife Trafficking in the Bureau of Oceans and International Environment, Environmental and Scientific Affairs in the Office of Conservation and Water. Rowena regularly collaborates with U.S. interagency as well as other government uh, governments, NGOs, and the private sector. She has deep expertise combating wildlife tra trafficking globally as well as other such as trafficking in timber, precious metals and gemstones, and crimes associated with IUU fishing. In the realm of environment and health, she engages in efforts to prevent future pandemics by decreasing risk from zoonotic, um, excuse me, from zoonotic disease, emergence, and spillover, and promoting a One Health approach focused on uh, animal and human uh, environmental elements. 
She also works on many other environmental challenges in the foreign policy arena, including illegal deforestation, illegal mining, chemical pollution and air quality, and ocean, and ocean topics. Rowena has extensive diplomatic experience in multilateral negotiations, serving in leadership roles on U.S. delegations to multiple forums and conventions. With a strong science background, zoonotic diseases and bioterrorism, um, she was a freelance consultant uh, and an American Association for the Advancement of Science Diplomacy Fellow for Scientists in Policymaking. She is currently on detail with the State Department's Office of Sanctions Coordination, focused on the nexus of sanctions and environment, including efforts to combat transnational organized crime, corruption, and human rights abuses, and protect environmental defenders. Her talk uh, this afternoon will be, um, is entitled, In International Policy and U.S. Leadership, Examples of Foreign Policy Intersections and Impacts. Oh, good. Okay. Hi, everybody. So I do not have slides, and I will probably be faster so we can make up a little bit of time. Thanks for reading my entire bio. I think that that, well, what I want to kick off with is saying how I've been State Department in the civil service for 12 years, and um, I think a lot of people have no idea how much all the things that we've talked about here today, I've worked quite a bit with Steve on One Health, in a number of different fora, including last week at UNGA, where we chatted with um, the Botswana and officials and others together. But um, all of these topics really come up quite a bit. And so um, I'm really excited that this uh, panel or this um, board, this National Academy of Sciences board is renaming itself to expand the aperture on what you're looking at and how you're looking at these issues. Because I can tell you that they really come up. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm across the street at the main State Department building, and since I work in the, the main policy office that deals with wildlife and animal anything, we really get questions all over the place on, on all this on all this stuff. And it's it's a very good time to be talking about these topics because I think that there's a lot of high level interest from the White House across the interagency and expertise on things like we're recalibrating our relationship with nature, we're addressing the biodiversity crisis, we're addressing the climate crisis, we're dealing with a very, very new landscape for the One Health approach, as um, uh, Steve and Tracy are probably very well aware. So I think in, in uh, the wake of COVID pandemic, there's a lot more interest in really drilling down into the zoonotic disease dimensions of uh, pandemics because maybe HIV and Ebola and Nipah, all of those weren't enough. Maybe COVID was enough with its wildlife origins uh, to get people to really look at the One Health approach. So um, these conversations are, are happening. And what I think I would like to um, give to the panel as more of a question is, and, and as well as an emphasis is, the U.S. is really seen in a leadership space on all these topics, on, on, animal, on animal welfare, on laboratory care and use, on wildlife conservation. We give tremendous resources and we have tremendous expertise. I think some of our um, panelists have already talked about how uh, we help other countries. We come in, we, we uh, have projects. So we give a lot of money and time and knowledge in, in these areas. And um, I want to give a couple examples of where uh, these things have come up even in the past year. And there's been questions with, within the interagency and with partners. There's been either confusion or questions and where things like, um, especially animal welfare, I think is really kind of a, a fuzzy space with a, lo a lot of vagueness that could use a little bit more transparency and, and guidance from a, a board like this. So I'll, I'll, let me give those few examples and then I'll come back to a couple um, closing thoughts and maybe I'll, I'm a good transition person for our discussion. Um, okay, so the One Health approach, quadripartite, um, that's been mentioned, well, not the quadripartite so much, but the One Health has been talked about quite a bit today. Um, One Health's been around for a long time, right? But have we really seen, as some of the things that we're, we heard about today from a couple of our speakers, there's still a lot of work to do on the sort of the wildlife and animal and environment dimensions of One Health. The, it's, One Health's really been about human health, and maybe it's been about... Um, uh, food uh, 
safety, really. That's what it's been historically, I think. So a, a few years ago, um, my office started an interagency One Health group that was focused on the wildlife and environment dimensions of One Health. And at first we got a lot of pushback from, not pushback, just maybe question, skepticism from a lot of the other One Health groups across the government to say, we already have a One Health group, you know, USAID has a huge One Health program, so we, we've got it covered. And our response was, well, not really. The, the wildlife and the environment pieces have, they really aren't being robustly addressed. They aren't being robustly addressed at the WOA. They're not being addressed through the, at the time it was the tripartite of the FAO, WHO, and what was then the OIE. And so we started this group that's still um, running um, more or less monthly. And Suzanne with the Smithsonian has been a really helpful part of that. But pulling out of the out of the woodwork, so to speak, in the USG, all the people that were really looking at the, the interface about spillover, about wildlife conservation, biodiversity conservation, wildlife diseases, just for conservation endangered species, wildlife trafficking, confiscated animals, what do we do with them? So all these topics that are relevant for One Health and for science and conservation, who was really looking at those? And more importantly, what kinds of policies do we really want to see from that? So I think one of the most relevant conversations I'm hearing now about in, in this group, as well as across the USG on the One Health is, what are we doing with our surveillance? If we're looking at wildlife disease surveillance that was that we were talking about earlier, where, where's that data going? Who are we asking to change policies? Are those policies going to be in, um, in an agricultural setting? Are they going to be about what wildlife species are going to be legal to trade? So where are those, where's that data going for something like disease surveillance with animals and wildlife? Who's really looking at that? So these are these are getting into not only just having these collaborative discussions, but what, what I'm seeing is a need for the scientific community and the scientists and conservationists like, like this group to drill down into not only identifying the scientific problem, but identifying the question and possible solutions and then feeding that to decision makers, policy makers, um, perhaps other countries and partners. That's where we're really, the US again can be a leader there and understanding those steps is, is really something that, that is a need. So that's, so that's one example is where the wildlife and the environment dimensions of One Health had, had been neglected and there's some questions and solutions there um, for, for the US uh, expertise to address. Another example um, is going back to the welfare piece. Um, in 2022, the UN Environment Assembly passed a resolution on animal welfare, environment, and sustainable development nexus. I don't know if anybody's at all is familiar with that. No one's a, a, um, familiar with the UNEA resolutions. So in my world, the UNEA resolutions, so UNEA is the, the UN environment body that deals with a lot of these questions about biodiversity, environment, and conservation. But this particular resolution to even address animal welfare and how does it intersect with the environment and sustainable development, it, it was a very awkward negotiation and conversation. So I think several African countries had wanted to put this resolution forward, but the whole topic of animal welfare has been sort of dissociated from conservation, right? And so I think that there's a, there's a disconnect there generally about animal welfare, anything, but as we've seen today, animal welfare is connected to health standards, connected to trade, connected to um, our edge in research and development, et cetera. So there, there, it's part of what needs to that so um but and that resolution sort of clunking along into to do the study of how does animal welfare interface with environment and sustainable development goals but it's an example where i think the expertise exists and the u.s could be 
leader in asking the right questions, bringing the right information. Um, and a very interesting example and example I want to share in the wealth that's happened over the past year is a wildlife trafficking case that um, took years to put together. Um, I've been working on combating wildlife trafficking for years and years, but usually anything with research animals um, is that hasn't really come up. So I'd say that research animals at all, and, and certainly not research primates, those aren't the usual things that we see that are discussed for wildlife trafficking. We're, we're talking about penguin scales or ivory. So we're talking, and sometimes we're talking about maybe songbirds if, if we're dealing with live animals, but there's a whole gamut of things that are illegal, illegally traded for wildlife, but the research animals wasn't really something that um, anyone had gone near or really studied. There's a lot of money in research animals, which I think most of us are aware of. So um, there's a case that's an ongoing Department of Justice case right now where um, government officials in Cambodia were illegally sourcing non-human primates from the wild, saying that they were captive bred because they couldn't breed the numbers fast enough to, well, or they had the opportunity to sell more and more because they were so, the non-human primates, the long-tailed macaques were so in demand. So they just started pulling them from the wild. This was a problem that was against international law. It was against all kinds of laws. It, it's, it's a zoonotic disease risk. They're claiming some things uh, laboratory bred when it's not. So it, on and on, lots of problems. But basically, because there was a, um, some of the animal rights groups that were, that cared about having no research primates or asking questions about it. And there was not a lot of transparency with the pharmaceutical companies who were using non-human primates. There got to be just this murky ground of no one wanted to share information and ask hard questions. But what really had happened was, and this is still somewhat of a gap, the regulations for bringing animals in and for quarantining them really didn't take into account um, adequate uh, trafficking concerns. So there was a law enforcement clash with some of the laboratory, the regulations for bringing in an HPs. And I think that that's still an ongoing discussion that certain folks within the USG are gonna be taking a harder look at. So, but my, my point was that the wildlife trafficking case and DOJ's case, that should be, it, it, everyone should want a legal supply chain, right? It, it, absolutely. And the fact that there was animal welfare concerns and non-transparency and uh, gaps in policies, this has made it actually more difficult to, to talk about. So that's another thing that's just come up in, in this past year in, in my world on, on combating wildlife trafficking and, and the U.S. Task Force on Wildlife Trafficking that um, I'm, I'm sharing. So th those are ideas that there's a lot of things that this um, group could tackle and be a strong voice for U.S. policy and U.S. leadership. Um, I get I have so there were so many things that are, are coming up that people mentioned today earlier already. You know, there's IUCN, there's CITES, there's the Convention on Biological Diversity, there's the Pelly Amendment, there's the Antarctic Council, um, there's the Sustainable Development Goals, Sustainable agri Agriculture Interests, so on and on, where uh, this or this group is very relevant to foreign policy and these questions about animal care, animal use, animal welfare are, are, are super important. So I think um, I think that's about all that I wanted to cover. And yes, thanks so, so much for looping me in here. I'm sure it was a, a little bit of a different profile. <laughs> Thank you, and I think that's a perfect bridge to our discussion. Shall we jump in? Do people need to take a little break? We have another, at 4.15, we're taking our official break, so I think we can, if it's okay, people will just move right into it. What incredible speakers and so much covered. Um, it's it's a little challenging to figure out how to structure this conversation. I, I thought maybe we should just start by going back to our first speaker and just allowing 
Um, if there are questions that people have directly to those speakers, just have two or three questions. And then at, let's say, maybe four o'clock or so, um, we'll talk in general terms, have some themes uh, that we can all of you can weigh in on. So, um, so with that, uh, I wonder uh, if Dr. Hankinson, I don't know, Claire, I can call you Claire. I wonder if um, we can just ask you to answer some questions and I, people may have been taking notes and uh, if any, if anybody wants to jump in, that's fine. I can, I have a, a couple of thoughts, but unless anybody else does, I'd rather, okay, well, well co collect, collect your thoughts. And um, I was really interested in the transparency movement or initiative, or can you um, give a little bit of background about a little bit of history and, and what's the, when, when did that start and what is the state of it now? Um, so, it really came, I have to credit uh, the UK, Wendy Jarrett, um, who was working very closely on what was called the Concordat. And it was an effort to provide information about research, what was going on within the walls of um, research institutions to the public in an effort to dispel kind of the, the mythology around it and dispel some of the negativity that was assumed to be part of it. Um, it was a really important effort because she had to get endorsement from multiple institutions and she did. And I, I'm sorry, I don't I have a different talk somewhere. and I can give you the specifics later of how many institutions signed on to that concordat. Um, and that was an agreement that they would talk about the work that they did. And it became such an important positive outcome because they saw the number of requests for information diminish. Um, they saw more positive public support. And it kind of met all of the goals that they had hoped, which was if we talk about what we do more so, then maybe there won't be so much resistance publicly because of a lack of knowledge and understanding. And so from that, now there have been multiple countries that have moved forward with their own versions of an agreement. Um, the US group started pulling together. I wanna uh, really credit Paula Clifford, who's with AMP now, um, because she pulled together a group I think it was the 2019 ALAS meeting um, to begin to talk about what it would look like if we had a US agreement. And it was a, a really interesting conversation around the table because a lot of people felt we weren't ready as a country for it. And there's so many different sectors that work with research animals that wouldn't feel comfortable opening their doors, so to speak. So we made it, uh, we, we sort of, you know, pivoted a bit and said, okay, we're not going to do an agreement that everyone signs on, but we're going to do an initiative. And how would that look? So the website now has, it's taken several years to get there. It's a, it's a grassroots organization, um, people volunteer, and we've had um, dozens and dozens of, of individuals in the research world join in because I think we want to see something change. People need to feel like they can talk about the important work that they do and not be silenced by the fact that it's something that might be punished publicly. Um, and from that now has sprung a number of ongoing, including the what if campaign that we really organically thought of after a session in February and, and decided we needed to continue to push out into social media realm um, to the public. What, what would it really look like if you weren't able to get your medicine tomorrow at CVS that you need in order to um, feel okay, what would that look like? Um, and and there's been a lot of resistance to, uh, I think using tactics that might be viewed as um, fear fear based. Mm -hmm. However, the algorithms that we all are so attuned to now in social media are exactly that, like to make to be a little more provocative. Mm -hmm. And so this the. 50-50 split of public support to public, you know, um, lack of support in research, we really need to tip the balance and, and to begin to do it more openly with some transparency. That's that's the goal. And it's going to take a while, but I, we're making some inroads and we have a lot of um, internal support for that as well. Thank you. Can I quickly ask, make us a, a thought on that last slide you showed medical advances that have been made or aided by research animals. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to medical advance, what if there were conservation advances, you know, mm -hmm. species preserved and, and, you know, even, and companion animals 
Absolutely. I mean, just the yeah, I think it can be very robust. Um, mm -hmm. The that's been sort of a, a slide that I've enjoyed adding to over the years as the as those seem to get the most public prominence. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly this year um, with the vaccine, that seemed to hopefully ring true for a lot of people that had had at least some direct um, access or interest in that specifically. But yeah, I think that 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 list has um, has been could be developed in many different ways for, for the board, for sure. Yeah, you know, and on this board, we've had conversations as part of the sort of the decentering of homo sapiens and this landscape of mm -hmm. species of um, thinking of ways to um, thicken the eras that go from the biomedical insights yeah. to other species. Absolutely. So that's... Yeah, thank you. No, oh, all right. Let's go on. Um, so, can I call you Symphony? Cynthia? It's okay. Yeah. Cynthia? All right. So, um, your phenomenal talk. Um, people want to jump in and. I, I think people have to go back a little bit and. Um... So, you were talking about um, rescuing, I think, some of the marine mammals from the area, is that a relocation to a different area and do they home back to the Gulf of Mexico or how does that all process? So we, yeah, there were two different situations we were talking about for rescue. One um, is the, the need for some intervention in Barataria Bay and there's no translocation or relocation of those animals at this time. Um, the other one I was speaking of was Brazil, where dolphins are being um, basically trapped in a shallow, warm part of the Amazon River and would benefit from translocation if they were stable enough for that to occur. And so that's why there's a whole group there now that's, that's evaluating how could those animals safely be moved with veterinary care um, and monitoring through the translocation process. But if we go back to the Barataria Bay Dolphin situation, which has that restoration activity that's planned for that area where fresh water will be diverted in, there has been a lot of thought about, you know, do we just, um, how do we mitigate the negative impacts that we expect to happen to the bottom of those dolphins living there? There's 2,000 about now, and if they all go extinct, that means there'll be 2,000 that that um, die with 25% of those losses in the first year. So that's a large number of dolphins that would be in distress and then um, you know, eventually washing up. And so there's been, a, there's been good discussion about what would you do to help move those animals? We've done um, site fidelity surveys where we've put satellite tags on many of those dolphins that we've examined and they don't move. <laughs> they stay, we, you know, for lack of a better term, they're homebodies. There's a lot of bottlenose dolphin populations that act like that. Others will migrate along the coast, they're coastal dolphins. These are, they live in Barataria Bay, they, they reproduce, they feed, they do everything there. So, um, and some of them have a very tight home range of just a couple miles. So it's unlikely that even in the face of a freshwater um, drop that the animals will move. So, could you move 2,000 dolphins? Where would you put them? What does that look like? How does that alter the species um, in terms of their genetics and dynamics? So a lot of questions remain about how to handle that situation. Well, and just to expand, that's a, that's a big question, I would think, with regard to the climate change issue, because you have some species that are going to migrate as a result of the climate change, that's birds right. being a great example. And then you have others that are sort of trapped where they're at. And so then we have to know how to handle each one individually in order to um, help resolve the concern that might be occurring for those species while we're still dealing with what to do about climate change. So um, I think that's the, the more I'm learning about it, the more I'm interested in how do we, you know, successfully parse out, okay, for these species, 
they're going to be okay moving north or south. Um, we're we're going to not worry about them. These species moving is going to be a problem. So mm -hmm. we got to address that. Or if they do move, it'll be a problem because there'll be a new predator or a new prey species in a new environment. That's right. And I'll just follow up by saying those all will come with animal welfare and ethical considerations, as well as the biological considerations. So it will be interesting to make sure the right people are at the table to help address all those different dimensions of the issues if you do determine a species can or cannot be moved or isn't um, stable enough to be moved. So it's a great thing to be thinking about. Yes. Yes. Is the freshwater incursion um, common to many of those sorts of mitigation efforts? Because I thought that in a lot of places, a big problem was the saltwater incursion into the into the low-lying land too. Yeah, it depends on the species um, and the area. And so is, you know, if the question is, uh, are the animals used to freshwater influxes? Certainly when it rains and there are parts there are bodies of water where there will be freshwater influxes. Um, and then there are management activities in the Gulf of Mexico in different bay sounds and estuaries. Well, they'll, they'll divert uh, rivers and when flooding occurs, they, they'll need to move water. Um, but there are some species that cannot tolerate those, those significant shifts. Some will move away, some won't, and will just be injured by the, the freshwater influx. So I'm not sure if I, completely address your question, but there are management activities that just have to move water around in order to prevent um, flooding of, of different human areas, uh, human communities. Um, right, I, I, I think I was sort of more asking, is that a common um, strategy where that what they're doing, is that a common strategy in similar sort of ecologic, mm. er, in, in similar sort of environments? Yeah. Because I, then it, that's, that's just one of many, it's just the beginning of it. Yeah, I wouldn't call it a common strategy. Um, I would say it's been it's been um, utilized before, but this is this is in the marine mammal community being seen as um, just a, a significant strategy that is going to have uh, consequences for the marine mammals that that live in that in that area. So um, yeah, something like this has not occurred before in that area of the country. Oh, yes, uh, Roz. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, Cynthia, for a really terrific presentation. It's just an amazing body of work. And as those of us who work in the aquatic environment with wild or marine mammals know, it's incredibly difficult to get the, that kind of detailed biomedical data. So it's just, it's really great work. Um, uh, one thing I was wondering with, uh, I know you have an extensive amount of data in over 13 years now, and I don't know if it's uh, long enough or if you have the right types of data to determine in those animals that do reproduce successfully, are you seeing evidence of transgenerational effects on the physiology function or pathology and the F2, essentially the second generation in? Yeah, that's, hi Roz, great to hi. see you. <laughs> Um, yeah, they, uh, it's early. So it's a long lived species and it is early to know for sure if there will be um, the next generation or transgenerational impacts. We are seeing that in the successful um, females, some of those were not alive at the time of the spill. And so um, we're, we don't have enough animals, enough data to say for sure that that um, is an important factor, but it uh, makes sense with the rest of our data to believe that that's going to be how it plays out. So we'll have to see how the data comes in. Um, but uh, it will need probably decades more um, until we know for sure that it's not transgenerational. I will say with the pulmonary, with the lung disease, I didn't go into the detail of the lung disease, but the good news is that we are seeing um, chronic progressive lung disease in the animals alive at the time of the spill which has absolutely been correlated with pregnancy failure in terms of maternal illness and leading to that placental dysfunction. In the animals that were not born yet, we are not seeing the same incident um, of uh, moderate to severe lung disease. Those animals so far are coming um, out to be healthier. 
And so again, that also supports that we are hoping that we will see this pregnancy um, failure, or sorry, the pregnancy success rate increase. And we were just back this summer, the data is too early to, to know for sure, but, but we're hopeful that we'll start to see that, that rate increase, the success rate increase. Great, thank you. So, yes. Uh, great talks, and actually my comment or question could be asked of any um, any of the talks speakers today, um, And but I wanna address you specifically and also um, Claire. Uh, you know, Claire, when you presented about the, you know, the, the, the sex as a biological variable and the effort that it took to overcome resistance to studying females as well as males and the ongoing issues with that, I think that the same applies for study of pregnant individuals, either humans or animals. And there's a lot we don't know about pregnancy and maternal adaptations to pregnancy and reproductive tissues as a reservoir for infectious disease and how um, you know there's long-term impacts that affect successful pregnancy. So I wonder um, about that in, in these issues that you guys have brought up, any of the speakers, that um, how our lack of knowledge about maternal adaptation to pregnancy or um, res as a reservoir for disease or whatnot, um, impacts your work. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it, it does impact the work. Um, so for the, the GOMERI, the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative funding that was available, um, and I don't know how many are familiar with that, with that funding opportunity, but it was a millions of dollars that were, um, that were set aside from BP and given uh, to an, and they set up an independent uh, funding organization that was headed up by Rita Colwell. And it, they just did fantastic uh, work in distributing the money. That infusion of funding across the board, advanced science just leaps and bounds. And so marine mammal science and our understanding of dolphin reproduction really changed over the three to four years that we were able to focus. So we're starting to address some of these really important questions. Um, and, and like I mentioned, we were able to go back into the archives with the Navy animals and look at um, decades of successful reproduction it was harder because of the, the smaller numbers of failures. There's a lot of questions still there, but we're starting to get closer to understanding risk factors, um, diagnostic uh, signals of what, what does the placenta, how is it changing? What does it look like when it changes, when, it, when it's infected with brucella? What's the likelihood that that pregnancy is going to fail? And so we're starting to fill in those gaps which is extremely helpful. And I think we'll have significant overlap in applications to endangered species medicine as we get into um, the need for reproductive assisted or reproductive efforts to really help these species um, along and make sure that they continue to thrive. Sonic, can I just add something? This, um, the idea, the thinking about pregnancy and, um, and, and we've talked a lot about surveillance and mostly around zoonoses, but the idea of, of animal surveillance for, for non-communicable diseases that we know are, that there are a number of anthropogenic changes that are impacting, uh, particularly our pollution and climate and on uh, premature birth in humans. And so one of the, I've heard, I was at a conference where people were discussing, well, in, in non-human, just sticking with mammals, in non-human mammals, in shared environments, females, you know, what, what, is, what is happening with pregnancies? Are there, are there species survival events that are related to premature? I mean, there are all, there's just any number of, of questions to ask that have been pretty ignored and are, and are pretty fundamental. <laughs> Yeah, in, in the in the dog genome study, I mean, it seems like there be might be a lot of overlap for looking at genes and the environmental impacts that you're talking about. So, yeah. yeah. And I would just add too that um, I, I'm just pulling up so, some data that I had on this whole topic. It's really sex as a biological variable goes well beyond just pregnancy. 
So it's impacting things, um, neuroscience, for example, how um, brains are different, um, but in lots of ways, brains aren't different between males and females as well. And there's been this assumption, like just decades of assumptions made, but it's never been looked at. So the, the plan to go forward in this is to kind of just answer a nice set of of questions. Is it known that the disease process or event applies to only males or only females? Is there evidence that there are differences um, in how a particular disease incidence occurs, how the treatment acts, et cetera? How could sex influence the process? And if there's no reported difference in the literature, is it because it's not been studied or reported? Um, and so even beyond the um, topic that, you know, which was Cynthia there's just an example here that the sleeping drug Ambien was tested mostly in male animals and in men in clinical trials and was later shown to be far more potent in women because it was metabolized more slowly in the female body. And interestingly, across all drugs, women tend to suffer more adverse side effects and overdoses. Um, this has also been true. Major depression and post-traumatic stress disorder are twice as prevalent in women, but tests designed to mimic the symptoms in rodents are typically developed and validated in males. So it, it goes on and on and on. Um, and I, I'm glad at least so we're starting to address it, but it's like my point in bringing up that it's been six, seven years now since uh, that mandate from NIH everything we do is just, it's going to be a slow, like there's always going to be the resistance that, um, you know, Marino brought up. It, it takes time for people to accept that change. And it's why I threw in that change management slide, because as we're moving to um, embracing more aspects of conservation, diversity, wildlife, uh, migration patterns, all of these things, it, we have to get people to think outside of their own little world, I believe, and how it can impact them. So part of that openness, um, back to Barbara's question initially, is we have to make this relevant. We have to draw people's emotion into it. We have to try to find a tie so that they think that it actually impacts them too. Um, and I think there's lots of ways to do that successfully. Yes. Yes, uh, Tracy, Dr. Goldstein, you're on. There we go. Okay. You know, just thinking about this conversation that you were just having, um, there's a fair amount of work um, in marine mammals showing um, high levels of exposure to pollutants. You know, Cynthia was talking about oil, but there's a lot of contaminants that um, have ended up in the ocean and um, whether it's PCBs, DDTs or flame retardants. And this question around um, sex is really interesting. There's been a lot number of studies that have documented that when females give birth, they dump that contaminant load into the, the fetus. Um, and a lot of studies still trying to understand the long-term effects of that. Of course, we know that there's been some um, studies shown that the levels that you're finding in mammal tissues is way above immune disruption that, you know, what we know from um, experimental studies or from um, reproductive failure in, in, in people. And yet these animals are surviving out there, but we don't really understand the long-term effects on, on, um, on the, on the calves. And we also don't understand the interplay with those contaminant levels and diseases. And then the males don't have that same opportunity to offload contaminants. And so this um, sort of understanding about sex and, and sort of life history and timing of life is really important and making sure that we're looking at all those um, various variables um, in terms of trying to understand, are our oceans cleaner? Are we successful? You know, how are these um, contaminants changing? Thank you. Do people have questions? Yes. And I, I was going to, uh, I appreciate that because that prompted when we're thinking about studies of behavior, we, there's so much we have yet to learn, I think, about behavior of all these species. And I loved the um, trafficking um, dots that Steve was able to show where the females act very differently than the males um, and all the impacts that that has as well. Just, just, I mean, I would never even have considered that, but it completely makes sense once it's explained and we have some data to look at it. So um, I, I think there's, there's so much yet, yet to be learned. And so when, in my world, when people are like, well, you know, we shouldn't be sending animals at all. It's, it's going to be really helpful that this board can say, but we're, animals holistically and we're getting away from the lab animal term because it's it's really animals period that we need to study more 
Great. Are other questions for uh, Tracy? I, I had one question at the end of your talk. Uh, you mentioned this success with Marburg, uh, kind of early detection and and an intervention that it, that reduced what could have been something. Could you tell us a little bit more about what what specifically you guys did? Yeah, um, honestly, I'll um, credit that part to the work that the CDC did. Um, so initially, after we found that, um, we worked to train the labs in the region to be able to detect Marburg virus, not just Ebola, Zaire. So that was, you know, many of the assays were focused on that. And then also working with um, many of the clinics um, to make sure that when they were seeing hemorrhagic disease, um, that Marburg was also on the, the list of differentials. Um, so interestingly, um, we were working with some teens, for example, in, in Tanzania, and immediately they were asking because of um, requests from their government was, could we share assays that would allow them to detect uh, Marburg virus? So I think it was a combination of CDC starting that work and then um, through USAID funds, able to um, build that capacity in other labs in Africa. So it both, ra um, both raised the awareness and then the ability to do the testing. Um, I think Marburg is probably not as infectious as Ebola Zaire, so perhaps we would have had limited um, outbreaks anyway. But the fact that we were able to mount responses much more quickly um, certainly helped to get the word out and to um, you know, limit contact in, in, in cases. Dr. Goldstein, I had a more of a curiosity question in your presentation when you're talking about surveying all the different uh, species for coronavirus. Was that just looking at respiratory coronaviruses or were you also picking up, you know, FIP and the cat and the domestic animal and mouse hepatitis virus and the mice? Yeah, so um, we were using broadly reactive assays. So you're, uh, we absolutely were detecting anything. We were finding canine coronavirus um, in dogs, a number of um, different hepatitis viruses in mice. Um, and then um, we did find 2 to 9E, for example, in primates and, and in humans. And so, yeah, we were looking broadly. We were not, um, at the time, focusing specifically on respiratory viruses. Thanks. Okay, the first question is, One Health is great because it's so inclusive and real world, but also strategically challenging because it's so broad. Is it possible to develop an overarching One Health strategy or is it really a set of principles? Good question. Um, I think that one Health is an approach. I don't think, my opinion, not a strategy, right? It's a way to look at complex problems and bring in various parts of the sector to, to answer that. So if you're talking about emerging and infectious diseases, that might look different than if you are talking about um, addressing extreme heat, um, such as we saw this summer in, in, in Colorado. So really, um, it's about looking across the sectors and looking across the partners and bringing in the appropriate um, partners. I think one of the difficulties with that, and, and you know, we can hear more from um, sort of our State Department colleagues, is that th th it is difficult to break down silos and, or, and work across sectors. And then funding streams, and Cynthia mentioned that too, funding streams often go along those, those silos. And so I think we definitely have some challenges in terms of how can we both um, bring in the right partners, communicate our results, and then also have funds that can be used across sectors to address complex problems. Um, I'll leave it to others to add more. Okay, I'll just add to that, Tracy. Um, and I'm not, uh, you two are definitely the experts, but I'll just say from my perspective, as we're thinking about, um, you know, these marine mammal specific problems and wildlife problems, I see it more of a mindset and, and thinking, making sure that when we're approaching our problems, we're thinking about it holistically and how does it interface with the, um, with human health, with other animals, with the environment, 
uh, and with the planet as a whole. And so I think it can be overwhelming for us as that aren't the experts and are more practitioners in trying to um, to make sure that we're uh, really embracing what you're what you're uh, trying to uh, implement is that we're just we just needed to focus on that right mindset and not be laser focused on a single species or a single problem. Um, next question is and then. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree with uh, the great responses on One Health. I think there was a time where everybody wanted to do One Health and it was sort of like fairy dust and people wanted to spread it everywhere. I think that's because it wasn't well-defined. And I think we've got a, a better sense of the holistic approach that it represents. But I think it starts with solving the problem, you know, addressing the problem, defining the problem, because not all problems are necessarily going to be One Health problems. And I think it's been alluded to in a number of presentations, the transaction costs of working cross sectors are significant. That's why it, it's often not done. So for me, if I see a problem that requires that type of work, then you can justify the transaction costs. But I think that step in some cases has been skipped in the past because it was just sort of, well, we're just gonna do one health. And in many cases we need to, I mean, I, a lot of these are complex, wicked problems, but I think sometimes we have to keep in mind that it, it, it takes more effort to work across sectors, and as as was said, funding streams are almost ex almost never tailored to that type of cross sectoral engagement. Which is, um, I think that Tracy used the word approach, the One Health approach, and actually that point about it's being so broad, and and we can see it as a confluence of all kinds of ideas, and how nice that is. In the multilateral negotiating context, that's actually kind of a problem because it, it's a way that it can get thrown out. Like, hey, we don't know what it is, so we're not going to agree to it. So somebody mentioned in one of the talks the INB negotiations on the pandemic instrument, and there is a whole focus, wonderfully so, on One Health. And there's discussions now about what is it going to say in there? So what is the WHO-led negotiations? What are they going to say about One Health? And so a, a group like ours would, should really care about defining a little bit of what, what are we, it, in some settings, it's fine to be super inclusive and enormous. And then some settings, we, sh we should be willing to come to some kind of agreement on what, what part of the One Health approach matters here. Why are we using it? What are our results? or what impact are we really looking for? And that touches on the investment in, in time and money. Thanks. I see some interesting parallels between the term One Health and three R's. Um, so three R's having come up in 1960 and, and, and now there are three R veterinarians that people didn't know that at companies, they're hired specifically. I'm not really sure what for, but they are doing work in this space because it's very broad. And so I think it's, it's a good question that was raised, but I still think it's okay to have three R's and have lots of different compartmentalizations out within that now, and the same for One Health. Uh, it almost becomes like a brand, right? And then, so what does the what does the brand represent? And it allow, I believe, it doesn't have to be one thing. It has the nimbleness and flexibility to be um, co-opted by anybody and leveraged in a lot of different ways. And so, I, I think it's I think it can be really positive um, in how we use it. Yeah, and just briefly to build on, I think in just sort of your comments on the IMB um, convention, I, I think in that situation, it is really clear what we're trying to address, right? And this is zoonotic diseases, you know, for pandemic prevention. And and I think there, it's very clear that there's a, you know, a direct link between animals um, and, and human disease and, and that contact. And so I do think it's important that the right people are at the table um, to to craft that language, um, because what often happens, and I know everybody in the room knows this, is that investments start out by saying we need to invest in animals and we need to invest in wildlife, and it's so important. And then very quickly, um, the funding shifts to 
um, to focusing on the public health system, which obviously needs funds as well. And then the next outbreak occurs and we're back where we started again. So I think in this situation, it is really important that we expand what we consider our surveillance system and that we invest not just on the human health side, but on the animal health side, because otherwise we're just going to continue to be in this chasing our tail, you know, responding constantly situation. Um, we have to do something different. Um, the the welfare issue and One Health that, that you had mentioned earlier, the, the awkwardness of those discussions, um, I think apart from the Cambodian monkey imports, uh, the other big thing that hit the news were the, the 4,000 beagles that were confiscated from a breeding facility. And one wonders, how does this kind of thing happen in this day and age? And um, I think it is largely driven by the money behind all of this and the people who are employed by this. So lab animal veterinarians are typically not at the forefront of animal welfare in, in these large overarching incidents that occur like this. It tends to be um, people that we consider extreme, so sort of animal rights people. And that division really shouldn't be happening. Um, lab animal vets tend to be employed by the biomedical industry and it becomes very awkward within five minutes to have any kind of nuanced conversation about, about welfare, about supporting biomedical research. Um, the USDA inspects all of these facilities, often their relationships with the biomedical industry that tend to be a little bit more comfortable. And uh, again, awkwardness creeps in. So there has to be some way to have these nuanced conversations that's a safe space. Um, where it doesn't get so polarized. We have, I'm, we're, we have only one or two more minutes. And um, I, I did, there's a question from uh, an audience member. So I just wanted to, uh, to direct it towards you. Thank, uh, it's, uh, thank you first for our last speaker. Is the U United States supporting the UNEP project to study how animal welfare intersects with environmental and human health? That, that's the um, OEDA's. Yeah. Yes, question. it's a question. Is the U.S. supporting the UNEP project? Um, so I think that there's a call for funding. I don't know specifically how much the U.S. is giving. We are one of the largest, the United States is one of the largest donors to the United Nations and to, U, to UNEP. So I would say broadly speaking, I, we, we, we are supporting UNEP. And are we specifically donating for that um, call for funds for that study? I'm not sure. So I don't know where that's, that stands. I just know that we were instrumental in getting that resolution passed and supporting it. Well, it's it's 15 after the hour, and um, it's time we it's time to break. But I know this conversation is going to continue. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers. It was really phenomenal. I mean, each one of you um, is just doing such important work and communicated it so effectively to all of us. So this is just the beginning. Um, we're thrilled that you were here at our inaugural Basker meeting, and uh, we're going to take a short break and come back. Uh, the, the board members will come back. Thank you.